Hello everyone, it is time for this week's live stream. Let's hope everything works properly today. Last week this camera would not connect whatsoever to my computer and I had to give up and just use the built-in FaceTime camera and it was terrible. Hi Martin, you are first. Are you related to Hugh? And I'm sure you've heard that many, many times. Hi Amar and Michael, you're not quite first, you're actually third. Reefer Matt, you're here, hello. I enjoyed your video today. That was very well done. Hi, Paul. Okay, Jack, don't bark. <laughs> it's like now that I'm set up, you decide to start making noise and boofing. Hopefully it won't be too horribly distracting. Hello, Atkins Nature Aquariums and Larry and Andrea. Thank you for being here. She is my super moderator. She's always here. Hey, guys, I have some huge news that only a few people know. Um, so I'm going to call out my buddy Eric one more time on the live stream. I'd say, oh man, I feel like we talked about Eric two years ago, and he had cancer, it was spreading, it was bad, um, he was doomed, COVID was happening, he was getting treatment, but then because of COVID he could not get treatment, he couldn't get in the hospital, which made the progress he was making go backwards, and the uh, cancer was spreading because he was not getting the treatment, and then finally they like i don't know feels like just over a year ago we were basically saying goodbye to him like these were the final months and he we did a fundraiser in club milo's reef and probably this channel too if i remember correctly and we just said let's just get him enough money to pay for what his reef tank needs for the next 12 months i don't know we probably raised two thousand dollars which would cover electricity and maintenance and things so he had something nice to look at during his dwindling days well, they told him he would not live to see Christmas. You know, they, they basically enjoy the time you have with your kids. And, uh, you know, it was terrifying. I mean, it was just so sad. So uh, just, uh, it hurt the heart, right? And then suddenly he announced huge news a couple of days ago, past Christmas, that he is in full remission, that he's had so many surgeries and apparently he's knocked it out of the park. I mean, I don't even know what to do with that information because he was told you're done. And now he's not just still kicking. He knocked it out of the park. And, you know, so I'm just like, oh, my God, it's gone. And so then he corrected me and said remission. I'm like, okay, okay. But still, that is huge. So congratulations, Eric. I'm really happy for you. We're not going to pay for your reef tank this year. <laughs> um, we, we hope you continue to enjoy the hobby as well as this new leg on life. I mean, I don't know all your details of your day to day, but I'd like to think that your health is gonna get stronger, your, your energy is gonna increase, your muscle mass will improve because, you know, all good things. I wish you the best and I wish you success. Uh, he did something interesting. He ripped out every piece of coral out of his tank, which was a really nice tank, it was really pretty. He'd been sharing it for some time in Club Milo's Reef. And it was down to just rock and some fish. And then he got a new order of corals, and they were just different corals. He wanted to go with a whole new look, I guess. And so he says, this is big announcement number two. So now he's planting a bunch of new corals in the tank, and it's exciting, and it's different. And I, again, I'm really happy for him. And I'm really happy the corals arrived, because he had a huge snow front storm coming, and they said that it would be here like around the same time, and the package arrived mere hours before the three feet of snow slammed into his house. Okay, if Jack is awful, you have to let me know. Um, and I'll go close that door. You just have to tell me how bad it is. But no, I'm really, really happy. Congratulations there. And, uh, you know, thank you for keeping us in the loop and allowing us to be your friend, you know, remote. I mean, I've never even met Eric. He's up in Canada. And yet we have a relationship. He, he designs all the coasters that I give in every order. He does the banner at the top of the group uh, on Facebook. And, uh, you know, he's a moderator. He helps make sure that everyone is being good. And uh, super guy. So, wow. Just, just fantastic. <laughs> okay, uh, Jack stopped. That's good. Uh, before we get into our topic for today, I want to kind of do a, We never did a recap of 2022. So I did a quick check. We had 77 videos last year on this channel, and 44 of them were Let's Talk About. 
And in those 44, we did not once discuss the deep sand bed. So that is why we have that for our topic today. But just, uh, I'll just rattle off the list just for funsies. Uh, during those uh, different live streams last year, we talked about New Year's resolutions, reef temperatures, old tank syndrome. We talked about cleanup crews twice for some reason. We talked about reef safe fish, starting a reef club, rescaping a running reef, Acropora, because that one deserves its own show. Uh, at least five times, it was just a wild card Q&A where I didn't come in with a topic and we just got into it. We talked about cyanobacteria, ICP testing, protein skimmers, aquarium lighting, hobby longevity, my huge news of buying the Japanese pygmy angelfish. Uh, we discussed corals spawning in your tank and how you should not miss this and you should catch it and see it and film it and document it and share it with us. Uh, we talked about the new 27 gallon aquarium, the, the simple setup. And uh, we talked about the summer heat issues. We got into a huge discussion about Kalkwasser. We went in, we had a opportunity to have Michael Vargas come over and talk about reef photography. We then did the big reveal of the new studio. We talked about Macna, water changes, aquarium issues with their solutions, about having patience and observing growth rates of corals over time. We did the nine year review of my 400 gallon reef that happened last November. We had Small Business Saturday for my little tiny company, reefing with a newborn with Devin of Reef Dudes. We got into quarantine tanks, why they're beneficial. We did a stream with the Fritz crew. That was a surprise stream. Uh, we talked about gifting livestock to your spouse or family member and surprising them with something new to put in their tank. And then finally, we wrapped up the year with eels. Now that was all the live streams. Then in the regular videos and behind the scenes and the shorts, uh, there was 13 reef diaries, which I'm thinking about bringing those back. I'm kind of on the fence, not immediately, but I could see it happening shortly, even though I've already been starting to do stuff with my tank that would have been great as a reef diary, but I did it already, so you missed it. Um, we uh, had a video about taking down the anemone queue that had been running for 3,000 days in a row. It was crazy the day I drained it was mathematically the 3,000th 3, day. Um, we, uh, and I still don't have the tank, <laughs> I still don't have the tank set up yet. It's terrible. It's been over, a year. it's been almost a year. Uh, we had a video about the Japanese pygmy angelfish and why it was so special. I did a video about setting up and cycling the new Caitlin's Reef tank. We did an algae turf scrubber review. Uh, I showed you guys some statues or maquettes that are all from Marvel and, uh, uh that type, you know, from Comic-Con. Uh, we got to see Ryan's 1,000-gallon reef with the cloudy glass on the front. I gave you an update on the 27-gallon. We took a quick look at my tanks in one video. We did the nine-year anniversary official video where I showed you all the corals from every possible angle. Where I talked about every bit of the filtration as a narration. And then we wrapped up the year with the Fritz Lagoon tank. So that was a lot that happened, 77 different things that we got into. It's you know, there's only 365 days and somehow I seem to live and breathe saltwater aquariums nonstop. Then today, I surprised, well actually yesterday I surprised you with a little one minute video and I bet you didn't get a notification because it's one minute and that's why no one's watching it. And that's okay, it's not even for everyone. But the thing is, I got a new product installed in my tank. I've had it for a while. I couldn't install it at first. I had to keep cutting out different shape holes on the CNC till I got the perfect size. Then I finally got the thing installed and then I couldn't calibrate it. And then when I went to YouTube to look for tutorials, there was only one that didn't even match my situation. I went to the Neptune forums to learn how it's done and couldn't find anything, even perusing thread after thread after thread. It's like everyone that calibrated just kind of did it. They got through it and they didn't explain what they did. And I was stuck because the calibration process was very specific. You had to have, so what it is, it's called the liquid level sensor, and it looks sort of like a tape measure that you put underwater. And it required that I have the water level at one inch, and then at some other number, which I didn't know, and then probably at the highest number. And I thought, well, how on earth can I remove water and add water to pull off this stunt rapidly enough and not have the, the software time out? Because if my container had to be down to one inch of water, I'd have to pump it all out somewhere. And I'd need multiple buckets because it's a 43 gallon container. 
and I don't want to just pump it into a barrel because my barrels are not pristine and my RODI uh, reservoir is. So I, I always keep that super clean. I never put anything in there because I don't want to pollute it and get any TDS in there whatsoever. I keep my hands out. I mean, I've had this thing running for years and I only reached in once to install the pump and then I put a lid on top and that's it. And now I installed this other thing and that's it. But anyway, I had to do that. And then, like I said, I couldn't even advance the software to find out how many different markings I'd have to uh, calibrate to. So I decided, all right, I can't find any information. I'll text someone I know at Neptune who didn't reply to me for a long time. <laughs> I was just like, oh my God, if I only knew how to do this. And then he finally did. And he says, you don't have to calibrate it in the vessel. You could do it in separate containers. I'm like, oh my God, that's fantastic. So I made this little tiny video tutorial, that, like I said, one minute long, maybe 115. And I uploaded it so that if anyone else is trying to figure this out, maybe it'll help them. Now, in the Neptune group, one person made the comment, you could have calibrated it in your display tank. Probably could have, I think, not certain. But then I would have gotten salt water all over the thing, and I had to really clean it well to put it in my top-off water that has to be pristine again. So I'm glad I did it the way I did it, but it never occurred to me to use the display tank. So that's another alternative if you're trying to calibrate this device and you're not really sure how. So if you didn't see the video, it's on the channel. It's easy to find. It actually is a screenshot as the thumbnail of the task in, Nept in Apex Fusion. All right, and then today I snuck out a video that I've been working on nonstop for weeks. It's uh, been one thing after another, and I've been filming and saving and adding into my movie editing software. And then I would trim it a little bit, and it was so long, and I kept cutting it down. And even after all the cuts, it still was a 27-minute video, because if I did it in eight minutes, there'd be so many questions unanswered that I feel like if someone wants to do what I just did, they kind of really want to know the ins and outs of it. I can't help myself. I, I'd much, I would love to be able to do um, humorous, funny, entertaining, brief videos that are super popular and go viral. I would love that, but that's not how I'm wired. I am wired to explain how something works explain how I overcame it or how I thought it through or what I was doing specifically and why I did it that way. And uh, I thought, and I mean, I watched six or seven or eight videos on making different fire pits, lots of different styles, lots of different approaches, but there was some specific things that worked. And there was some things I saw in each video. I thought, oh, that would be cool in mine. I would love that. And I'd like to uh, incorporate this and I definitely don't want to do such and such but in all of those things there was never specific information what you needed to know and like for example how many of those blocks I needed in a circle I kept pausing videos and trying to count <laughs> I was like why is no one saying how many you need so uh, I did I put that in here I actually took my software I used for minion and I drew those blocks and made them into a circle which was no no easy feat for me I basically created 14 blocks and I pivoted each one correctly around my circle and then I had to move them around as I did the video and uh, yeah, at least it'll be useful to someone that wants to do it because now they have some uh, real life examples they can copy and mimic and I already had one or two people say if I'm going to do one I'm literally going to be re-watching this video because you showed me how so that was the point of the video I wanted it to be helpful I love that it's smokeless it's working super well. I've probably burned, I don't know, five or six fires since I finished it. And uh, I, I, I hope you guys like it. I, I, you know, I know it has nothing to do with reef keeping, but at the same time, my channel sometimes does get a video that has nothing to do with reef keeping. That's okay. So I hope that um, you get a chance to watch it. Let's see. Um, all right. I think that's it for all the news. Eric, fire pit videos a brand new issue of coral magazine came out i received them i will put them on the website if you are one i lost all my little things like for shop and club yeah they're gone i threw away a bunch of stuff it was a terrible mistake and i've got to find the art i don't even know where it is let me see if i can find it in here let me find my let me look at my everything folder <laughs> how about live stream art could that be it Ooh. I found it. All right. I'm going to fling this up here right quick. If you would be so kind as to shop at milasreef.com, 
I uh, appreciate it because it's how I pay my bills. And it's the only thing I do for a living is build things out of acrylic or sell you dry goods, like some of the things you see in the background there. Uh, there are probably over 300 items on my website at this time. There's probably another 50 that need to go on the website that I have here in inventory that I am going to continue to work on adding and getting into the uh, shopping cart area so you guys can see what you know things you need. These are typically the things I would use myself, and that's what I sell on my website. And that way, hopefully, if there's a question, I might know the answer to it because I've lived through it. Um, or I just believe in the product so much that I can include it in my shop. I don't just add anything just because it exists. And I never have. I, I just, I'm not wired that way. Um, I do RODI units. Uh, I build them on a regular basis. And I have been selling them now for 20 years as of, I started in 2003. So I've been doing it longer than BRS, <laughs> if that matters to you. I, uh, I, I find that um, I constantly see people say, hey, where should I get an RO system? And then there's like 19 people say, BRS, they're the ones, they're the best. I'm like, Pfft. so anyway, <laughs> there are other options out there and uh, I'm one of them. So I'd appreciate uh, your business if you'd like. And I order in five or six pallets of RODI parts a year to keep up with demand. So that's a little plug for me for today. I will go ahead and remove this from the screen. And uh, I wanted to mention next Saturday, there will not be a live stream because I will be in New York looking at giant aquariums. So I am heading out of town next week and I will be gone for several days. Jack will be boarded. Uh, the tank sitter, I need to notify him today and make sure he'll be able to watch the tank for me while I'm gone. And uh, hopefully nothing surprising will happen with the reef and it'll be healthy and happy like you've seen this video right now. And that, I, the reason I'm not standing in front of the tank today is because I worked on the calcium reactor and then the tank got cloudy. I was like, ah, okay. I actually shot this footage uh, a week ago and never used it. So you're getting it now. I might even just upload this 15 minute clip and just leave it on YouTube with some music. And that way someone can just run it as a background if they wanted at work or at home. But uh, yeah, so I will be out of town and I'm, I'm taking care of a client order. And then I'm gonna go visit Polo Reef and I'm hoping, to, and then I'm gonna go visit the Long Island Aquarium and uh, do some other stuff, see some friends. And then I'll head back and uh, I'll be back just in time for my birthday. <laughs> so I'm excited about that as well. Another year around the around the uh, the sun, correct? Okay. Um, the topic. Before I get into the topic, I'm going to do one more thing that I usually do at the end. I'm going to remind you today is water test Saturday. Please test your water. I don't want to put it at the end because I have a feeling some of you hit stop five minutes from the end to miss that part because you don't want to hear it. So I'm putting it right now. Don't fast forward. <laughs> Do your water test because they help your reef. They literally save lives. So if you are an, if you own test kits, use them. And weekly is your bare minimum. Okay, that it should just be a thing you do every week. But just because you tested today does not mean something couldn't go terribly wrong tomorrow, and you have to go do another test. All right, you just have to be on top of things. You have to be vigilant, observant, um, and with a little bit of luck, you'll be successful. So we want to make sure that we are using all the tools at our disposal. You know, when we decided to get an aquarium, one of the first things they said is you got to buy test kits and refractometers and thermometers. Why? So we'll use them. It isn't so you will use them in the beginning, but now you don't need to use them anymore. We test our water because it will help you know what's going on in your tank and keep you in the loop. If, hey, shh, you be quiet. If for some reason you um, see a number you're worried about, you can always do the test again or even three times just to triple check that that value you see is correct. Because if you have a crazy low number that you're not expecting or a crazy high number, it could just be that you made a mistake with a test. So make sure everything's being done properly and that way you will uh, at least have the information. And then you can decide how you want to address it. Do you want to solve the problem rapidly or slowly? Is it something you can do throughout the day or do you have to deal with it right now? Is it something you're going to deal with over the next week? Certain parameters you need to go slowly. Other ones you can go more quickly. But if you don't test, how would you even know what you need to do at all? So please do your water test. All right, now our topic for today.
we are going to talk about the deep sand bed or a sand bed at all. A deep sand bed is typically four to six inches deep. Not very many people do that these days. My reef started off as a four inch sand bed years ago. It may be a little bit less. It's definitely deep in the center under the rock work. And then it kind of tapers based on flow in the tank, as well as uh, cucumbers moving it and other livestock doing what they're doing. But uh, the benefit of a deep sand bed was to denitrify the water. It was another method of removing nitrate from the system. And if the sand bed is healthy and it has a lot of beneficial bacteria in it, then it will go ahead and work in your favor. Now, there are other people that completely are against sand beds. They'd rather have a tank that has a glass bottom because they feel that the sand bed is a nutrient sink and they just say everything evil is trapped in there and it's just waiting to release and destroy your tank. So uh, I'm not from that school. I don't believe that way. I've been running tanks with sand beds for 25, 26 years now. And I do know that cleaning the sand bed can help, but normally with a deep sand bed, we don't touch it much. Uh, it's not something you would vacuum weekly is my point, but doing some kind of service to the sand bed every six months or once a year can definitely be beneficial to remove a lot of trap nutrients that caught in there, a lot of detritus. And so we pump out all this water that looks very brown and dirty. And you observe too, as you're vacuuming, what you're seeing, you know, Hopefully you're up on a chair or a step stool or on a, a ladder or on a walk board and you can look down as you're vacuuming and see what you're unearthing. And if you just keep seeing sand and, you know, then as you're working the vacuum and you're pinching off the hose and the sand drizzles back down onto the sand bed itself, you can see if there's a black spot, for example. If there's a black spot, vacuum, 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 get it out. <laughs> if it's just sand, like quicksand, just keep cleaning because all you're doing is removing the detritus. The life of the sand bed is the upper half inch. That's where all the bugs live and the little tiny worms and the pods and such. They all are, that, that, those benthic critters, they're living there in that upper half inch. So if you have um, creatures that eat those and devour those, your sand bed could become lifeless. It could become just sand and, be, uh, and trap detritus and get ugly and turn hard. And what else happens when you have no life? Oh, and grow algae. That can actually happen. Algae can grow on the sand because it's lifeless. Now, what can cause it to be lifeless could be a couple of different things. You could have something major happen in the tank. You could have something in there like a sand sifting starfish. Those things eat all the life out of your sand. That's literally what they do. That is, they, they have one job. <laughs> they eat the life, okay? They do not eat the waste. They eat the life. And so you end up with a dead sand bed and then suddenly you've got things growing on there that normally wouldn't. You'd have a film, it kind of looks, you have cyano outbreaks, you have uh, it just brown fuzz on there. You might even see hair algae just cropping up on top of it because there's no life left. And you might say, well, yeah, but this thing is turning it. Turning it doesn't make it healthy necessarily. It definitely, there's motion. I mean, you could turn it yourself with a rake, you know, with a little tiny plastic rake. but that is not a good creature for a reef tank. And it's usually best to put it in like a fish only tank uh, and a predator tank if the predator doesn't eat uh, uh, starfish. And so I don't recommend sand sifting starfish on a reef tank. There are people out there that have them, but I don't recommend it. So I'm going to uh, put that out there. Things you can put in the tank that will help keep the sand bed cleaner would be Neisseria snails, lots of them. Those are good. Sand conchs, fighting conchs, Cucumbers, the, you know, the ones that stay down on the sand, you know, the larger ones. They could be the tiger tail cucumber, which is my favorite. There's these other ones that are just big and pink, big and black, big and uh, brown. There's these blobs, they look like a turd, right? And they are going to eat from one end. They actually extend out these appendages that look like little mop heads. And they're each one mopping the sand and then they put it in their mouth and they lick it all clean and they put a different mop down and they have like, I don't know, several of these appendages that come out and they just work in rotation. And then the other end of the cucumber, you have these little pellets coming out, like little uh, hamster droppings. And that's just nice, clean sand bricks that fall apart after a little bit or a little bit of flow or you just get in there and kind of mess with your sand bed a little bit. They'll completely dissipate out and look flat again. So it's not like you're 
creating these bricks and now you're stuck. What are you going to do with it? The cucumber is processing the sand. Surf and starfish are good for uh, working their way across the sand and as they dance across and reach across and have their little tentacles out, they're good guys. Spaghetti worms, if you can get your hands on some, definitely good for your sand bed. They live in the sand bed. They put out the appendages. They're constantly trying to capture detritus. They're, they're, they're pretty to look at. I like them. Uh, they, they're little, the hairs that come out, the, the spaghettis, right? They actually are typically like an orangish color with little lines on them that makes them look segmented. And uh, I, I always put them in my tanks. If I find some in one tank, I will grab some and put them in the other tank intentionally to spread the wealth. And then you might end up having less of those because of the fish in your tank. For example, if you have a uh, copper band butterfly, it may choose to devour those and then you won't have any. Or you may have wrasses that will consume them. Oh, there's another good reason for having a sand bed. If you like wrasses, there are quite a few wrasses that sleep in the sand. And those people that choose not to have a sand bed at all, sometimes will put a small container somewhere in the tank, possibly behind the rock work or in the corner where the wrasses can go to sleep at night and then it comes back out. But you kind of have this weird Rubbermaid container, you know, this plastic dish inside your aquarium. It doesn't look very natural. So, I prefer a sand bed. I think it looks better. Now, one of the reasons, another reason why some people don't want a sand bed in their tank is because they say, I can't get enough flow if I do the sand blows everywhere. Well, that comes down to how you have all your pumps set up for creating flow in the tank. And closed loop applications, uh, different power heads such as the Vortex or Tunzi or... Uh, the Neptune's Wave or, uh, I don't know, CJ Pumps, uh, Jabo. I mean, there's so many brands on the market. You can orient them however you need to to maintain a nice, clean sand bed without blasting the sand and sending it flying. We want all the flow to be above the sand, not on the sand bed. But we also don't want it stagnant to the bottom of the tank to where the sand gets no movement at all. It does need some motion down there, some minimal flow to help keep things clean. So if you're, want, if you're having a problem where you need a lot of flow in your tank, but the current sand you have right now just keeps blowing around incessantly, and it's been there for a while, like let's say you've had the sand bed for a year and it continues to move like that, then you may need a larger grade of sand. So I use something called Reef Flakes. It came from Tropic Eden many years ago. Reef Flakes is a sand that each grain is about three millimeters. So it's a little bit bigger but it doesn't look like crushed coral by any means. It's just a little bit bigger sand. Uh, it looks like normal sand to me, to be honest, but uh, it, it, it's just, it stays where it needs to stay. And I do like that a lot. When you're looking at the different sands from Carib Sea, for example, look at the different ones. There was something called Ulitic that was very popular in the early 2000s. That was the way to go. Everyone swore by it. If you didn't get Ulitic sand, you were a failure as a reef keeper and you had to turn in your card. But Ulitic blew around everywhere and everyone complained about it and everyone complained about getting in their cleaning magnet and as they're cleaning the glass It was scratching the glass and they were just miserable and I was not an Ulitic fan at all I was like, I don't want that. at all. I just want sand and so I went and found something I think it was called Fiji pink and it worked quite well uh, My pumps I have them running at different speeds at different times of day. I would orient the power head certain angles because I wanted to make sure that my sand was staying clean but was not getting blown about. Sometimes a power head, especially one held on the tank with a suction cup that I definitely don't recommend, that can fall down and blow your sand bed. And people have posted this over the years where half my sand bed blew to the other end of the tank. It's covering everything and I have a big bald spot because my power head fell. So there's a couple of tricks you can do when it comes to power heads. It's, number one, find some kind of a bracket or clamp system that is magnetic. That is so much better than suction cups. The second thing is all power heads have, an, have a power cord on them because that's how they spin. And so if you put a power head in the tank, the wire going up, you can secure it onto something. You can secure it onto your light rack. You can screw it to the edge of the canopy. You can use the sticky pads with a zip tie and lock it in. You can tether it to the back of the tank. Whatever it takes that if the power head pops loose, it can't fall. It's just going to kind of wobble around until you get home to correct the matter, but at least it cannot drop to the bottom 
and uh, stir up the sand bed. So that is a, a trick that works really, really well and uh, is simple. Another trick I have for sand beds, especially smaller tanks. Uh, back in the day, I used maxi jets all the time, and my 29 gallon just did not have enough flow down low. And I had I had so many power heads in that tank. I had four maxi jets in a 29 gallon to create adequate flow. And then eventually I built a closed loop and I got rid of them all. And I was really happy about that because the closed loop did a fantastic job. But if you need flow down low in the tank, finding a power head like the maxi jet or some other brand of pump that you feel, I mean, I'll just tell you what I did with the maxi jet. I would take the power head and I turn it upside down so that the motor was sitting on the sand and the nozzle was blowing across the top of the sand. And that worked perfectly. It was so easy. And I didn't have to worry about the power head moving because the motor was at the lowest point. Just because a power head is designed you know, to look right side up doesn't mean you can't turn it upside down or at a different angle to get what you need. There, it's all about deflection and, and uh, the, the angle of flow. Like for example, if I needed flow on the other side of the tank, and I had a power head on this side of the tank. I gotta put my hands on the camera where you can see them. So I've got my power head here, and I've got this side of the tank that's not getting enough flow, and there's rock in the middle. I can point the power head forward to bounce off the glass and come around the rock work. And what'll actually happen is you'll have a circular motion around the rock work all the time. So don't uh, feel like, well, I gotta put in 10 more power heads if I wanna get around these stupid rocks. There are different methods of doing this. Also having power heads up high, flowing downward at an angle could work. Having one point up and one pointing down can do something. Having two power heads blowing toward each other where they slam into each other can cause chaotic flow in the tank, which is fantastic. It dissipates and constantly is changing up. Using the random flow generators from VCA, which I sell is another super duper thing. I have them in all of my tanks and I love them because they're constantly changing which direction the water is moving as they're coming out of the nozzle. It, it's magical, no moving parts, totally does what they advertise, highly recommend those. Um, let's say you need to put more sand in your display tank, but it's running and it's beautiful and you don't know how. What's the safest method? A lot of people have said in the past what they would do is to grab a PVC pipe and stand it in the tank and then pour the sand down the pipe or take a cup and scoop it and pour the cups into the pipe one after another kind of tedious. I've never done it that way. What I did was I stopped all the flow in the tank. I cleared a huge area out of the center of my tank where there was no corals because I always have corals on the sand. So I moved everything over. So I had a big bald spot. And then I would take my bag of sand, my brand new bag. I would wipe it down completely on the outside so there's no chemicals on it as best I can. You know, just, I just used water. I didn't use vinegar or citric acid or anything. I just used water just to wipe it down in case there was anything on it. Then I cut the bag open, I just sliced it across the top, and I would turn the bag upside down and lower it into the tank to the bottom, and then grabbing the two corners at the top, I would just lift, 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 and the sand would pour out into a hill in the middle of my tank. And then I would spread the sand evenly across my reef. I had to do this about twice a year because my sand bed was continually eating itself. And the, way, the reason it eats itself, which sounds kind of crazy, is with a deep sand bed, you have a anoxic area down deep. I mean, remember, I'm trying to process nitrate and remove them. And the anoxic area has a lower pH. Well, the sand is calcium based. And so that lower pH is literally dissolving. I could almost not even say the word literally dissolving the, uh, the sand, the, the calcium and it dissipates. And you're, you might have put in 400 pounds of sand originally and you only have 350 now or 320. You're like, where did it all go? it's being consumed by the tank, basically through that lowering pH down deep in the, in the sand bed. So adding new sand twice a year kept my sand bed to the right height. And so I would just do that. I'd take my bag, wipe it down, cut it open, drop it in, shake it out, and then spread it out, and then put my things back where they belonged again. And then six months later, I did it again. And then the next year, I did it again, and again, and again, until I took the tank down. So this tank, I haven't really needed to do that. Uh, I didn't run as deep a sand bed as I did in the past but it could probably use a little bit of fresh sand. There, there's a couple spots where I like more. And then you may have a spot where the sand just never stays. I have one of those spots in my tank, but everywhere else it does. So I would say 80% of my reef is perfect when it comes to sand, but there's this one spot in the front on the, under that uh, tongue coral that's right there. 
way over there if you look to the far left. That spot always sinks down low, and if I were to raise it up, it's still going to blow that sand somehow to the other end of the tank. So I just kind of ignored that spot. I don't need it to look like a like a um, like a Zen garden. I need it to just be normal, be natural. If it's a little wavy, if it's a little bit more like a golf course, that's okay with me. You know, as long as it looks clean and it's healthy and it's not growing anything ugly, I'm all for it. And and straight lines are not normal in nature anyway. So even though you raked out that sand, you had it perfectly level, and you set all of your chalices on top or whatever, if it changes up a little bit, that's okay. If, it, if it's covering your stuff, if it's burying corals, that's a whole other argument. And then yes, you're gonna have to figure out what's the solution. And sometimes one of the solutions, if you are trying to keep things down low on the sand bed, but the sand is moving a lot, is gonna be kind of a weird, fix but it works you can take some pvc pipe that might be two inches in diameter inch and a half in diameter you know something a little bit bigger and you cut them to the correct height and you just press them down into the sand and put your coral on top so it's now on a pedestal it's on a pillar and that way if the sand moves you see the pvc underneath but the coral is still intact um pnw makes the or yeah pnw they make these little uh frag rack stands they're one plug only and I forget the nickname of what they have for those, but I used that under one coral that I wanted on the sand. And I pushed it all the way into the sand so you can't see it at all, and the frag stood up, and I was very happy. And the reason I hid it is because number one, it looks like plastic, and I don't want to look at that in my tank. I want to look at corals. And number two, it had the glowing edge, and I'm not a fan of the glowing stuff. If anything's gonna glow in my tank, it's gonna be my corals. It's not gonna be plastic stuff. So I try to keep everything looking as natural as I can. I, I I submerge things when I can, and if something becomes visible, I may rearrange the sand to hide it again. But that's a trick that can work. Another thing you can use in a problem area that might solve the problem is to get the rock from two little fishies that's called stacks, S-T-A-X. It doesn't look natural <laughs> at all, but what it is is it's the Marco rock that's been sliced into slivers, basically, and then you can lay that sliver on the top of the sand bed and put those corals you care about and as those corals are growing, they will completely cover and encrust that flat rock, but the sand won't be encroaching on your coral necessarily. It may help to put this solid surface on top of the sand or press it into the sand partially so some of the rock shows with your pretty coral sitting on top. So that's another option that may work out. Or you may need to actually put something kind of large underneath the power head that is blowing water across to create a deflection so that your sand stays nice and safe and doesn't keep getting blown out and leaving a, a big hole or bald spot. And that seems to be my whole list. Um, trying to think if there's anything else I did not include. Oh, washing the sand. If you are Okay, moving a tank and washing the sand. These are tied into the sand bed situation. If your sand bed is six months old or less and you have to move your tank, you can move your tank, scoop the sand out so you don't break the tank lifting it, and transport it and pour it in and not worry about it. But if the tank is over six months old, I always recommend that you wash the sand. And all I'm talking about is putting it in a bucket and running a garden hose in there full blast and stirring it around and around so all the lighter detritus comes out. The sand is heavier, it'll sink. It, it may blow around like a tornado, but the detritus is what's coming out. And if you jam the hose in there and blast it and then kind of stop putting the hose in there for a little bit, like un, un, unsqueeze the nozzle so that way the water stops flowing or take the hose out and then look, you'll see there's all this detritus blowing around and you'll see the sand immediately just kind of drops to the bottom of the bucket then you can kind of tilt the bucket forward and slosh out that dirty water that's on the surface with the detritus and the sand will be safe in the bucket. And you can do this repeatedly until the sand is nice and clean and then you put in one bucket of clean sand after another into your tank to start it anew. Uh, when my 400 gallon broke after 13 months, it just sprung a leak and water poured out everywhere. I had to completely drain the tank and clean it so that Marine Line could rebuild it from scratch. I took out all that sand and I put it in a trough outside and I had to wash 400 and some pounds of sand. And it, my lower back was killing me. <laughs> but 
There was nothing wrong with the sand. The sand is forever. The only reason I would ever get rid of sand that has been, um, that I deem unusable is either number one, it turned black. And if that's the case, it became sulfuric. And that is very dangerous for your tank. And anything, if you find a big black area, literally black, and if it smells like sulfur, scoop and throw away. Okay, don't even wash it. It's done. But if it is, um, or the other reason I'd get rid of it is if a piece becomes hard. This sometimes can happen in some tanks, and it's weird because you can't always pinpoint it to this, but it has something to do with uh, precipitation. And it really is calcification. I don't think it's an alkalinity thing, but regardless, if for some reason your sand bed turns really hard, don't make the mistake of trying to break it up to not waste it. Whatever is hardened, just lift it out of the tank and throw it away. And whatever remains is still good. If you need more, buy a little bit more sand and put it in. But if you were to break up the sand that turned hard as a rock, that became a crust, that became uh, petrified, what usually happens is after you break it up and you think, okay, it looks better, you're going to watch your tank decline. Something bad happens. So rather than taking the chance, whatever has turned hard in your tank for some weird reason, reach in, pull it out, throw it away, move on with your life, and let your reef continue to do well. Because your reef won't suffer when you pull it out, but it will suffer if you break it up. Now, um, what about, you know, why I said before, just washing sand. So washing sand, the reason it's okay to do is because it all started off as sand in the first place. Whether you bought dry sand or live sand, it's sand. Now, we want calcium-based sand, and the way to know if it's calcium-based, you just take a sample of that sand that you have, you put it in a small bowl, you add vinegar, and if it bubbles, it's, cal it's um, calcium carbonate. And that is, a, I'm, I'm, that's not the right word. What am I trying to think of? Um, I'm sorry, I can't think of what it is. But if it bubbles, that's good. That's the right sand to have. If it's a silica-based sand, which oftentimes would be used for sandblasting. It would be not used for a children's play area, like there's play sand. Don't use play sand. Don't go to Home Depot and buy play sand. Play sand is not clean sand. It has trace metals in it, and it can really wreck your tank. Silica sand, it just has a gray look to it. It's glass-based. It's not a great choice for a tank either. We want calcium-based sand. So test it. Bubbles, good sand to have. So washing it will not hurt it. Washing it will not cycle your tank. It will not start a new cycle when you put it in, in an existing tank. All you're doing is putting in clean sand, like putting in a clean frag rack or putting in, I don't know, something clean. <laughs> it, a cleaning magnet. When we add these things to the tank, they don't start a cycle. And I, a lot of times people say, well, if I put sand in my tank, it's going to cause a cycle. I'm like, no, it's not. So if you want to add live sand to your tank, it will not start a cycle. If you want to add washed dry sand, you know, or moist sand, you know, that you washed and it's still moist, just add it. It's not going to hurt your tank. It's not going to cause a cycle. Now, how much sand can you put in the tank at a time? I usually recommend no more than half an inch. And the reason I say that is because if you have a sand bed and it's got the critters in the top half inch and you add two inches of sand on top, you're going to smother the life in that sand bed. We don't want to kill it. We wanted to make it deeper. So you add enough to raise another half inch and all those little microfauna will crawl up to the upper surface and they'll hang out in there. And then you know, a week from now, two weeks from now, you can add another half inch and you can just kind of build it up to the desired height. If you have fish that are digging and, and uh, making piles in your tank or making caves, you probably should not have corals down on the sand because odds are you'll put something gorgeous down there that costs you a lot of money and then some, I don't know, $16 fish is going to bury it, and it's going to be dead by the, by the time you notice. You're like, where's such and such? Oh, I remember, it's right here. And you dig down, and you pull out a skeleton. So you want to make sure that you don't have things down on the sand bed. In those situations, having a tank that is feng shui would be ideal, where you have all the corals up on the rockwork where they belong, and you have that beautiful sand bed on the bottom. And if you've got a little guy down there that's digging and and you know and processing it out of his gills there's nothing for it to bury but those fish have the ability and i've watched it in public aquariums in huge tanks they will go down to the sand bed fill their mouth up 
and then it goes straight up the coral reef and pour it out on top of corals three feet above. It's the craziest thing ever. And so if you don't have power heads up high in the tank to blow those corals clean, to knock the sandbag, to drizzle it back down again, you're gonna need to stay on top of that with a turkey baster or something from time to time. All right, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Oh, last thing. I made a huge mistake with my brand new tank when I was filling it up with sand that I had washed and I was so mad at myself and my buddy saw me do it. And it's like, Mark, stop. And I'm like, what? I'm just pouring the sand in. He's like, you're ruining the glass. I'm like, what are you talking about? I got my arm between the bucket and the glass. He says the metal handle and the metal handle that was hooked on the bucket, the metal was just rubbing the glass. Going, oh. I had this gouge in the front viewing panel of my tank from day one. And I had to look at that for 13 months. I was so mad. I mean, I would have had to look at it for the rest of my life, but that tank leaked and it ended up getting replaced. Thank God. But if you're going to have to put sand in your tank, rather than putting in a bucket and lifting the bucket and pouring it in. Now, if you have a bucket with no handle, it's one less thing to worry about. But if you have a bucket with handles, my workaround and what I ended up doing on the second tank, <laughs> I was not going to make that mistake twice. I took all the sand and I put it in those kitchen 13 gallon bags. I just filled bags one after another from my big trough. It was all washed sand. It was dry. I'd been sitting for months. And I just scooped it into these bags and I carry those bags in holding my hands underneath because those bags are not strong enough to hold sand long term. If you hold them from the top, it'll just probably tear as it stretches. And So I grabbed the bags and I would put the bag inside the aquarium and flip it over because the bag had nothing sharp on it. There was no chance that I was going to damage the walls of my tank. And I put all that sand in my aquarium safely and no scratch the second time. So be aware, those are these stupid little things that happen. You're like, oh my God, how did this even happen? I thought I was being careful. Murphy's always watching you, looking for you to make a mistake. All right, that's it for now. I'm done with this topic. So let me scroll up and look for your questions. We're gonna take this part now to answer your questions and, uh, and, uh, and address your comments. And if you didn't do it, it helps if you put at Milo's Reef in front of your question. It just, it would allow me to filter this, but since I didn't ask you to do that before, I'm just going to go from the top down and work my way through the chatter. Ian, Ian, that's got to be right. Ian, Ian, <laughs> he says, you really need a home studio now rather than doing that every time. You're right. And actually that video was a total lie because I sat here at my desk and I could have filmed how I set up the desk, but there's no point. But I want to redo it anyway because my... When I do my whatever I'm going to do at some point in the near future, it's, everything's been painted. It, the room looks a lot better. So it needs to be done differently. It, it's just that's an old intro. And I like it because it exists. <laughs> so I use it. But no, I, to be honest, even in the studio, when I set that you know out there where I do all my work, I have to set everything up. It's another whole process. There's, there's nothing about just turn the computer and hit on. It's always get the lighting, get the mics, get the cameras get everything organized on the screen, have my list of topic in front of me, whatever. You know, there's a lot going on and it usually takes me about 20 minutes. And if something's going wrong, it takes even longer because it seems like invariably, no matter how much prep, there's just something that doesn't want to cooperate that day. And I don't know why it's like that. It should literally be a checklist and repeat. Uh, SBA Zane says, your tank is awesome. I have received lots of help from you. Uh, uh, keep at it. We need you. I am keeping at it. I, I never stop, do I? Like I said, last year, 44 live streams out of 52 weeks. It's not bad. It's not bad at all. It actually seemed low, but then I was like, no, that makes sense. There was some travel in there. Uh, Disbeat says, how much, don't make fun of me, so I won't. Does anyone know how long wet live rock can last in a bag? On my third tank, and I forgot about some rock that I bought. Ouch! Oh no! Well, listen, it, it doesn't just die off. Air exposure will die off things on the surface. So if there's sponges or if there's hitchhiker corals, there's worms, uh, tube worms, that kind of stuff, there can be some decay. But there's a lot of life inside the rock. And there are people that have had rock, live rock, that they saved because they know it's worth money and they put it in a cooler and they put it in their basement for six months with no water. It's just sitting in a sealed chest. 
And then they would take it out and they'd put it in their tank and the stuff deep, deep, deep in the core of the rock that was still alive all these months later emerges. So life does find a way, but what I would do in the situation where you forgot about your rock, I'd rec I don't know how much it was, but I would assume it's enough that it could fit, you know, it's not so much you can't fit it in a five gallon bucket. So set up a five gallon bucket, put in a big power head that's big enough to get some good circulation in there. Um, if it's a good power head like I would do, it's gonna add heat to the water too. But if not, add a small heater in there and drop your rock in there and just let it idle for the next two or three weeks. And you can test the water periodically and just see if there's an ammonia coming off of it. And you can take the rock out and smell it. And if it smells clean like the ocean, after those two or three weeks, it should be safe to put in your tank. If, it's, if it smells foul, if you're measuring any ammonia, leave it in that bucket a little bit longer. Do a couple of water changes on the bucket. And then finally, again, smell test it, verify there's no ammonia, and you can go ahead and place it in your tank. A lot of people are saying that the audio is bad. Uh. Well, it's been 47 minutes. I saw the comment crunch bar. I didn't know what that meant. So I apologize. I just thought you were talking about Jack was barking in the background. Let's see. You have to tell me what it means. <laughs> um, Brendan says, I built a rock with a, maybe he means rack, a rack with PVC pipe in the middle so I could fill it with sand and keep a long tentacle anemone in there since I need a deep sand bed. And I bought a red LTA, long tentacle anemone as my gift for graduation. Congratulations, that's awesome. Oh, thank you, Rob. Rob gave me a super chat. $5? You know how much money I... Oh, my God. I'm going to go buy something huge. No, I really do appreciate it. That was really nice of you. And I'm glad you like the fire pit. I love it. Matter of fact, when I finished it, and I was waiting for it to dry, because the mortar had a couple more days before I dare put fire in there, I kept looking at it and staring at it and saying, man, I built this. <laughs> and I kept just looking at it. And then finally, I got to start some fires in there. It's been great. Thanks, Chris. Yes, tank looks great. Stream is super sharp. Yeah, see, this is better, actually. Uh, this method, I like it better, even though I know it's not like me standing in front of the aquarium. Because when I stand in front of the aquarium, the camera will focus on me, and the background's a little blurry. So I, uh, I don't feel like you can get a good look. But this is so much better. It's just different because I'm not live in front of the tank where I can turn around and put food in there. Yes, Kyle. New York. Long Island. Manhattan. Eric says, if I added a cryptic zone that's 20 gallons, would you have a sand bed in there or not? Cryptic zones usually don't have sand in them. They have a lot of rock rubble and they are basically in pitch darkness. And Steve Tyree gave a presentation about this years ago to our club, or maybe a next wave to a, you know, a large, larger audience. And he had this monster sump and he took a third of the sump and isolated it to where it was super dark like i said and just filled with rubble and he says all kinds of cool stuff was living in there that he would you know spot with a flashlight versus the rest of the sump and the refugium area and all that kind of stuff but uh, i don't think you need sand bed in a cryptic zone michael says do you still have your yellow scroll coral tubinaria Reniformis. Could you talk about how difficult this coral is to keep, the growth speed, the placement, etc.? Did it maintain its color? Yes to all of that. I can definitely discuss that. Okay, so um, in this video right now, I can't point to it for you, but there is a cleaner acid just swam by when it was <laughs> two seconds ago. 
above it is a chalice and above that is the tiny little bit of yellow scroll coil right there. And then way over there to the far left under that little twig of an acropora, there is another yellow scroll coral. And then on the back of my tank is my biggest piece of yellow scroll coral. I find it to be a very easy coral to maintain. It just needs good flow and good light because the flow keeps it clean. If this thing grows like a cup, like a bowl, and you know, it can, it depends, you know, it could grow upward and do like wavy lines like, um, and what am I trying to compare it to? Like a picket fence, but that doesn't, that's not how they grow for me. They grow for that, like that in Joe's tank. Joe has these wavy crinkles and the, they stand up. But in mine, it's always a shelf, like a Montefiore. And so you want the flow to blow across and keep it clean. And if it's not getting that, you need to at least weekly take a turkey baster and blow it off because wherever the tritus sits for a little duration, a few days, that will become a bald spot. It'll just die underneath the detritus and you'll have a dead spot. Now the skin can regrow, but it tends to grow away rather than back. So you wanna make sure that it's staying clean. It needs enough light to grow. It definitely maintains the yellow. It puts out polyps that are beautiful little like yellow stars. And uh, yeah, it's one of my favorite corals. I got one from a club member years ago. That's where mine got started. And he, it looked like you could put cereal in it. It was like a perfect little bowl and I saw it in his tank at the frag swap and I said to him, how much is that coral? Because it was there all day. And he said, 20 bucks. I said, and no one bought that? I said, it's sold. I will come back in a little bit and just take it off your hands. And he was like, I'm so glad you got it because I know it'll live with you forever. So I put it in my reef and it was beautiful. Um, it was at that time when the tank leaked and the water parameters went all out of whack. I was out of town for three days to promote Macna. And when I came home, I was dealing with what I call DNA, just little bits of skin. So I moved the little bits of skin into a temporary tank. And I just said, if there's anything alive, it will grow into a coral again one day. And that's exactly what it did. It waited and waited. And then finally, it grew into uh, several puddles on the dead skeleton. And I had Mahanos appear on there and I'd scrape them off and then bubble out and I'd scrape those off. And I was like, as long as I can keep this thing clean, the corals will grow. And eventually the skin of one touched the skin of another and it became a solid puddle. I was like, yes. And then it grew larger and larger and got much bigger. And uh, it was one of the corals that took a monster hit in spring of 2021 when the potassium thing happened. And it, it went south badly. And I was like, what is wrong with this coral? You know, it was, it was, but again, there was some life left over and it's been hanging in there and it's actually filled in a lot. And that's why I have that secondary frag that you see that I was talking about that's underneath that acropora right there. It's been growing out quietly. It doesn't get enough light there. You know, just the front rim is getting some light on there because of the way those corals are above it. But the other piece that's under the shadow caster, it's doubled in size. And the one in the back has pretty much covered over all the dead skeleton and is doing quite well. So I don't find it to be a hard coral. It's not something you have to target feed. It's not something you have to feed at all, but if you're doing things like reef roids or Benepet's uh, Bene Reef or I don't know, the AB plus stuff from Red Sea, these types of different liquid foods that have very fine particulates, that coral can capture it and inhale it and, and devour it and help it to do well. But other than that, it's a, uh... now will it grow fast? No, it's a slow grower. So it's one of those patience corals that you just put in your tank and uh, put in a good spot. And think about where you're placing it too, because not only do we talk about light and flow, but also the color, because you want to be in a spot where it contrasts nicely with something near it. So if you have a yellow coral, a lot of times we don't put yellow in the middle of the blues and greens because it, causes, it creates that nice contrast. You're like, oh, that looks nice because it pops out like a diamond in, the, you know, in a black background. So if it's buried somewhere where it's in similar colors or your near corals have a lot of white tips, it might look kind of bland over there. So find a sweet spot. Kevin, so glad you're here. He says, I told you I watch your stream. He's proving it. Larry says, I added larger grain sand uh, alone with a tube anemone and clam. Yeah, I think I'm reading that right. He says, I siphon the sand bed every water change and it truly makes a difference. 
Larry says the one creature that destroys the sand bed <clears throat> is the pistol shrimp. I have a pistol shrimp in Caitlin's Reef, and it definitely digs around and it definitely covers things up. And it has that goby with it, the Randall goby. And I just let them live their lives. They just do what they want to do, and I just kind of work around them. Cuss Ram says, what about, you know, what are your thoughts on sand sifting gobies? Well, I hate them. <laughs> yes, and I said that with aggression. Now, I really don't like those because they literally are just going to keep covering your stuff. But if you have a reef that everything's on the rock work, you're better off than if you have anything down low. But if you, what, what do we put on the bottom? We put chalices. A lot of times there's zoanthids. Uh, there could be fungias. There's plate coral. There's the tongue coral. You know, all these things that are down low, they're all going to become victims to the sand sifting goby. So I, I don't like them. I know people say, well, I'm just going to put in there because it keeps the sand clean because it's sifting it all the time. Yeah, it's true. It is sifting it all the time, but it's just not worth the headache. I, that's why I've never purchased one. Aragonite, thank you. Okay, so calcium-based sand is called aragonite. Thank you for reminding me of this word I haven't said out loud in 15 years. <laughs> Hi, Tammy, how are you? Oh, Hawaiian black sand, great one. Um, Reefer Matt says, I made the mistake of using that with a magnetic glass cleaner. Yeah, uh, Hawaiian black sand has a couple of different attributes that are not great for a reef tank. Uh, number one, it's silica based because there's no such thing as black sand in nature. It just doesn't exist. It is made of glass. And there's some magnetic, uh, uh, what am I thinking of, features, uh, attributes that can cause chaos with a cleaning magnet. So you want to be aware of that. And by the way, I didn't mention this earlier when I did talk about oolitic sand. Well, I mentioned people with the oolitic sand, the super fine stuff that was just like dust. That stuff was scratching tanks with cleaning magnets. But the larger grain sand does not scratch my glass. And I have Starfire. That stuff scratches just by blinking your eyes at the tank the wrong way. But I can use my cleaning magnet and go near the sand and I never worry about it. And I don't scratch my glass with it. So it's not as dangerous. But I still try to avoid getting sand between the glass and the magnet. Thomas asks, do I, when I do my water changes, do I need to siphon the sand bed? Um, you can do it as needed, and it may be beneficial to do so every couple of weeks or once a month. It's when you're working your way around the tank, you're going to put the nozzle of the vacuum tube into the sand and you're going to watch the sand start rising and then you pinch the tube at the top to stop it from sucking any water out and then the sand will start dropping. But the detritus will be at the upper part of the pipe and that will continue to pull out some detritus. You can do that and work your way around the tank and you just keep pushing down, lifting up, pushing down, lifting up and releasing. It's something you're going to have to kind of do for a little bit to understand or if you can go up to your fish store and watch them do it, they can even explain to you how they're doing it or demonstrate so that you can understand the process. Because you want to be careful not to suck all the sand out of the tank, which is possible to do, or even just to clog the thing because too much sand got too high up in the tube. Um, and then you said, what can I put on my, uh, my pump to keep my anemones from getting sucked in? And some kind of sponge material. Some people have 3D printed a guard to put around the power head. Others have made a cage out of egg crate around the power head. Others have put pantyhose around. Uh, they've took the fabric that you buy, like a bag of avocados, and they tie that around there to create a crisscross pattern so that the, the animal cannot get sucked into the power head. Uh, those are some techniques that may work for you. Larry says, which sand do you suggest or recommend? I love Tropic Eden Reef Flakes. If it still exists, I would get that every day. And uh, when I bought mine, I bought, I don't know, like I said, there was 400 pounds of sand. I probably bought 360 pounds of dry sand and about 40 or 60 or 80 pounds of live sand. And what I did was I put all the dry sand in the tank and then I went ahead and I added some water and then I poured the live sand on top of it, which in my case, it was these little deli trays, like you would get chicken breasts in. 
and they were live sand. That's how they sold it. And I would just peel off the plastic and I would lower the tray into the bottom of the tank and I would just pour it in. And then once I had all my sand in the tank, then I'd put down something large like a, a plastic bag. And then I'd put a huge turkey serving tray on top of the bag. And then I'd put a vase on top of the turkey tray. And then I'd pump water into the vase. It would overflow onto the platter. It would then overflow onto the bag and fill the tank. And then as the water rose up and up and up, I could then at that point remove the extra stuff because now I'm not going to blast my sand and make it uh, become a cloudy mess. Oh, Andrea says my sound was good. Well, that's nice to know. I always feel bad when I'm thinking, God, for the last 47 minutes, I sounded like garbage. Moose drool, what a name, <laughs> says, are deep sand beds in a sump a good idea? They could be okay. They're, um, the thing is, the bigger the footprint is usually considered the more effective method. But then there was another, because there's always another thought of, you know, another opinion out there. There was another process where you could take five gallon buckets and you could just fill them, you know, like three quarters of the way full of sand and then have a pipe push water in and drain out the gravity and let it just do this thing where it's being a giant sand bed sink that uh, would be tied into your sump. And then if it were to get dirty, you could remove the bucket, put a new bucket in play and, you know, clean up the other one. And I was like, I don't really want to do a DSB in a bucket. It was just a weird thing. I don't even know very many people that did it. I don't know that I know 10 people that did it, but there was a lot of talk about it back in the early 2000s. And I just thought, why not just have a deep sand bed in your tank where it belongs? <laughs> why does it need to be in a bucket? So would it be beneficial in the sump? I don't know. If there's any chance that that sand could get sucked into your return pump, it could really damage the impeller. So you want to at least consider how can you keep the sand where it is and out of the intake of your power head, your, 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 any kind of pumps. Reactor pumps, manifold pump, closed loop, well, not closed loop, closed loop would never touch it. Return pump. These are the ones we don't want to damage the pumps. So it, it comes down to what you think. Chris says, what club do you belong to? I belong to DFW Mass, which is Dallas-Fort Worth Marine Aquarium Society. And not only am I a member, I am the president. I've been the president of the club for the last couple of years. I was president previously, back, you know, for like six years, um, I was president. So it's it just, I've been a member of that club since 2002. So this is my 21st year of being a club member. Uh, Gary says, do you have any concerns with any of your fish, namely the copper band, and your more fleshy corals, any issues in the past? No, she's been good. I've watched carefully. I feed the tank all the time. Matter of fact, she's very adamant to get her frozen food every night. And I mean, I know it will eat Aptasia if it finds any. It doesn't, it did eat some Mahanos, but I got some supersized ones that she totally ignores, which means I have to either ignore them too, or I need to get in there and deal with them, which I kind of feel like I need to, but it's just been like, ugh, I don't want to do it. But you asked about other corals. I've put in quite a few things in there with no damage. I have Lobos, I have Acans, I have Chalices, um, but I've not bought like a meat coral because I just feel like it's going to be a goner. I've not bought clams because I feel like that would just be dinner. Um, what else do I have in my tank that could possibly be? No, nope, that's it. There's nothing else for my copper van to destroy, but this fish has been a model fish from the beginning, which has been great. Lincoln says, do you have any thoughts on Reef Energy AB Plus? I bought a bottle and it's still on the counter, literally in my way. I'm about to put a TV tray next to the counter to get everything off my counter. <laughs> Just to put all my fish crap there because it's ridiculous. I have nowhere to put down food. Um, my house is my, my reef. So uh, I've not used it. I, I wanted to buy it because I've watched several videos. They were promotional ads on Facebook where they were pumping in this green stuff and the corals were like, ooh, ah. And I was like, I want to see that in my tank, but I haven't even done it. So I'm going to have to like check it for an expiration date, shake it probably, get a super long pipette that I think I own already and start squirting at the corals and see if any magic happens. But no, I haven't done anything myself. Um, 
want to show you guys something. And I've shown it to you before. I'm just going to do it again because I stumbled on it today. I'll throw it on the screen here. Um, this right here, this picture. Ah, where did it go? It vanished. Hang on, let me try that again. I want to do this. So this was my tank, I believe, in probably December of 2021. And the reason I put this on the screen is because this person right here said, my tank is all for eggs. Nothing but soft corals seem to grow, trying to get good growth. Um, my tank had lost a lot of SPS, as you know. Be, and when I corrected the problem by dosing three liters of potassium in the tank, that was the only thing I did. It turned things around. I planted a bunch of frags. And then a year later, this is what the tank looked like. Stay. So, and you can see the rock is almost completely invisible compared to what it was before that. Here's a lot of rock with, you know, what looks like, I don't know, a dozen frags. And then here we are a year later. This was actually 54 weeks apart. So that was one year and two weeks longer to what it looks like. And, you know, in the meantime, what you're looking at now is what my reef looks like now. So actually in this one video, I've not said anything until now, but there's a big dead coral right there under that big bushy thing on the left. It's a, it's a whitish looking thing that's kind of shaded mostly with like a couple of white tips just to the right of that green blob. And that was a really pretty and expensive Acropora, I loved it. And I thought it was just losing life because of um, the shading. I thought, well, okay, the shaded part dies, but the part that's exposed to light, it'll be okay. I'm not gonna touch it. I'll wait for it to stop doing what it's doing and whatever remains will remain. The whole thing died. <laughs> ah, So I have to remove that piece and see if I wanna put something else there. Um, just another reefer says, what is the coral next to your head? Um, it's a massive one. I love it. It always catches my eye. That is called a cactus pavona. It is Andrea's favorite. And I grew it from a chip. And there's actually more of it growing to the left of the green acro. On just to the left of it. And then underneath what looks like, well, what is a Montebora digitata. Just to the left of that Lyrotail anthias. There's some more of it down there. I really don't need it everywhere. I just need the big bushy head. And that was actually a smaller chunk. When we did the reef reset a couple of years ago when Dwayne was here, we saved one pretty piece and got rid of a giant amount of it. And we planted in that spot and it has just grown bigger and bigger. And someone else called it a different name, potato chip pavona. So if you're trying to find it, look for cactus pavona or potato chip pavona. Yeah, it, it's really, it really does grow nicely. Born to be a shooter. Josh says, what is that bright pink fish that swim around the front of the tank in the video behind you? That is called a Bimaculatus antheus, which I don't know why we don't have a nickname for it. If you ask anyone, that's a Bimac. But I think we should call it the scribbled antheus because the pattern is amazing it's gorgeous and that one you're looking at it it's above my head right now it's the male the male is fantastically beautiful i've taken some really good pictures of it and shared it on this channel as well as on social media like my instagram or facebook and it's a stunner if matter of fact i will find that find that picture for you right now because it wasn't that long ago i took it i feel like it was november let's see so close Of course, when I think I'll find it fast, I don't. There it is. Here is the male. Look at that thing. Ain't that gorgeous? Just insane. And I saw it in the store and I was like, what is that? I want it. And he said, that's a bimaculatus. I'm like, yeah, but what is it called? You know, what, what is it? He goes, it's a bimac. <laughs> I'm like, oh. So that's the male. And then this is the female. And a bimac can have multiple females, just like lyre tails. Also a beautiful, beautiful fish. Now, when I put the male in, immediately swam out in the open. The female, way more reclusive. 
but I've had them now for nine, ten months, and he's out all the time still. She's out more, but the liar tail is out more than she is. She tends to duck into the rock work for whatever reason, but they all come to eat. Oh, and I want to mention the ant, the uh, Achilles tang that I put in my tank, my most recent edition. I believe that was my November present to the reef. Out all the time, no fighting between other fish, other tangs, which is good, even though the yellow kind of chases it occasionally. And it will go right up to the to eat nori off the clip, which makes me really happy. I love seeing a tang that is eating constantly and always on the move and happy. And I and it's still the smallest tang in my tank. Really pretty uh, fish. And I'm looking forward to seeing it as it matures. Um, John says, hi from England. Isn't volcanic sand real sand like Tannerite? I don't know. Uh, just the fact that it's volcanic would make me think don't use it because we know uh, volcanic stuff involves sulfur and metals and I don't believe it's safe to use in a saltwater tank. I have to add that at the end. Uh, Lake Shia says, I'm just joining now, so I might have missed it. What are your thoughts on DSP versus a shallow sand bed? I'm considering doing a remote sand bed in my display refugium. Uh, I didn't really talk about shallow sand beds, even though I should have. I forgot. It wasn't even on my list. <laughs> I was thinking deep sand bed, no sand bed. But yeah, a shallow one is nice because it is easier to keep clean. It, it doesn't have a chance to harbor much because it's, you know, half an inch and one inch deep maybe. Uh, my anemone cube that ran for seven years had a two inch sand bed. Caitlin's Reef, I used a single bag of sand. It might be an inch and a half, I guess, of sand. And it's just easy to vacuum. And I, I get down to the glass almost immediately. And I, you know, when I do the water changes, I vacuum. I'm going to do a water change in that tank today. That's my plan. And so when I do that, I will vacuum the sand bed again in there to kind of, you know, remove some waste because that tank has only live rock and live sand and power head and air stone and heater and light. That's it. There's nothing else there to filter the water. So it's water changes and vacuuming. But uh, if you don't, and also keep in mind too, if you had a small tank like the 27 gallon, you know, that thing is like 20 inches tall, and you put a deep sand bed in there, it's going to look really weird to the eye. So sometimes a shallow bed, shallow sand bed is a, it looks aesthetically pleasing. It seems to match the look of the aquarium. So having some sand in there is better than um, having a big, tall amount. At the same time, there are people, like I said, they're going to like, oh, I don't want any sand in my tank. And I just, I hate looking at those tanks. I just, I hate it. I, mean, I like to tease my friends when they're like, hey, check out my tank. I'm like, oh, that looks nice. When are you going to add the sand? <laughs> you know, it's because sand hides the glass. I don't want to see the bottom of your aquarium. I don't want to see the detritus blowing around. I don't want to see... Corals starting to grow, but tons of glass still not grown over yet. Now, I have seen the crazy stuff where you almost think it was photoshopped, where the guy planted green star polyps across the entire bottom. It looked like a golfing green. It was just perfect. The exact same height all the way across. It was like a lawn. It was amazing. I don't even know if there was sand under it, but it was so cool looking. <laughs> but those are few and far between. Very few people do that. But uh, no, there, there's not really a lot of work when it comes to a shallow sand bed at all, and it might be easier to keep clean. Rick says, are you doing moonshine or a reef moonshine? I'm not. I'm not really doing anything. Uh, I did start something new last in the last week. I can't remember what day I started, but it, it feels like three, four days ago. I'm dosing two products from uh, Korallenzucht, the Flatworm Stop, and I think it's called Coral Power. I bought this stuff from... Um, saltwateraquarium.com, and it helps deal with acropora and flatworms. So I encountered them in my tank a year ago. I haven't seen them since, but I found them all over one coral in my tank. I did not know, I had not seen them in a decade. I dip, everything goes in my tank. And I had this one coral that was really unhealthy in my aquarium, and all my new stuff was doing great. Everything else was doing great. This one stick that was about this long and about that wide just looked bad, looked pale. And somebody says, have you taken a turkey baster to it? I'm like, no, actually I haven't. And I wish I hadn't. 
because what I did was I took the turkey baster and I thought if I do this and puff, 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 I'm gonna watch the skin just come off. That's what I expected and that would be the end of that stick. But instead what happened was flatworms went flying like confetti and I was like, are you kidding me? I had no idea. I did not expect that at all. Because like I said, I hadn't seen an aquaporin flatworm in my reef in a decade. Since my article on them back in like whatever, 2008, 2009, it was something stupid long time ago. And it wasn't on any of the new corals. None of the new corals had aquaporin and flatworms. But this ancient stick that's been in my tank for six or seven years was covered with them like stucco. <laughs> And when I set them free, they killed my Walt Disney, they killed my uh, home wrecker, they probably affected this white stick that I was talking about I need to remove. They're probably on that. And I'm just like, dang it. So rather than trying to remove corals from my tank and dip them weekly and put them in a separate tank and run the tank uh, SPS fallow, which you know it means zero SPS tissue in my tank, I'm just not going to worry about it. I'm going to use this flatworm stop. From everything I've read, it just makes the corals so beefy, so tough, that the flatworms just basically give up. They, they, they just can't penetrate the flesh. The coral is so robust and healthy, and uh, the immune system so strong that it won't succumb to them. And that should, erad that should eradicate them from my system. The downside is it's very expensive. Everyone I talked to, to about this idea said, yeah, but it's really expensive. And I was like, all right, you know. And so for the last six months, I was like, I really need to buy this stuff. I mean, I need to make sure they're gone, but I didn't. And then last week, I was like, that's it, pulling the trigger. And I had to buy it. And it was like $200 for the two bottles. And it turns out for my size tank, I need six bottles <laughs> total. So I need to order $400 more of this stuff to do a 90-day treatment. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it for 90 days, and that'll be the end of it. So... Is it true that bigger tanks cost more to maintain? Yeah. And when there's a big problem, it costs you even more. Now, Joe at the 20,000 gallon you know, reef in Long Island, he would not use this product to remove flatworms from his tank. He would go in there with a garden hose hooked up to RO water, stop all the flow in the big tank, and he would just water like, like you're watering a potted plant. RO water onto his SPS and watch the flatworms peel off and all his fish would come in and eat them. When I did that one turkey base and sent them flying and then of course my vortex just blew them through the reef, my fish didn't even know what it was. They had no idea they were supposed to eat them, so they landed everywhere. I mean, I couldn't even grab a net fast enough to start scooping out of the water and I couldn't try to capture them with it, you know, like a reverse suction on the turkey baster. I was so mad at myself. If I had had even an inkling there might have been that kind of infestation, I would have broke the stick off the rock and put it in a bowl or bucket outside the tank and then blown it off. And I really wish I had done that, but I didn't. I, I didn't expect that. I really thought I was just going to watch the tissue fall off and that was the end of it. So um, that is what I'm dosing right now, Rick. <laughs> uh, Josh says, forever needs guards for their anemones or you know for the pumps. Just go to Walmart and go to the craft section and buy some plastic mesh screening. It can be used, yeah, it can be used for needlepoint. And you could use that to wrap around something and use zip ties to tie it together and hold it on with rubber bands. There's a lot of different tricks out there. It just comes down to what you want to look at. Ivo Dave says, you have a really nice aquarium and you've helped me establish my first ever 75 gallon reef tank. Just wanted to thank you uh, live. Now, oh, you're welcome. And I hope that you're still here when I actually saw this and I'm replying to you. John wonders if anyone has any experience with C Lab tablets. I don't. Silver Creek Aquatics, yes, I am here in Fort Worth. I'm over south of Hewland Mall, sort of over toward. Well, I'm in Wedgwood, if that helps you. And uh, I need. Are you a maintenance company? Ron says I don't know where I got this. But I've been vacuuming my sand bed once a week. Should I stop doing so? How's your tank doing? If your tank's doing well with the method you're using, just keep going. If you want to do it less, you probably could. The fish store by me, Frank's, he would do it three times a week. He was constantly vacuuming a sand bed. And so his sand bed had that hill and valley thing going all the time. Like, like you could put golf balls in each one of these little scoops. And his sand always looked pristine. Everyone's like, oh my God, his sand looks the best. 
He's like, because he's constantly vacuuming, he's constantly changing water. And he did that for the longest time. I was like, man, that is crazy how much water you change in here. You never pulled up to a store and there wasn't a giant uh, spot of water you know, on the concrete because he was dumping out those brute trash cans right there into the drive. Uh, he's not doing nearly as many water changes. I doubt he's doing them weekly at this point. But that was the thing he did for the longest time. Daniel says, where do you buy your corals online? Uh, I almost never buy corals online. It's very rare. When Jake Adams had his fundraiser, uh, you know, to raise money for his wife, and, you know, because she's a widow now, he died a couple months ago, they did a big fundraiser, and I jumped on that one, and I bought from Merman's Reef. They gave out the stickers that says MILF, which stands for, man, I like corals. And uh, they did this auction, and I spent hundreds of dollars, and I must have ordered eight or ten corals. <laughs> and I had to put them all in my tank. Um, but normally I like to get them from the fish store and I can walk in and see it or I get them from another hobbyist where I go to them or they come here and they bring them, you know, that, that stuff happens, believe it or not. Um, I've got, a, I've got some friends here in the Metroplex where I might be visiting them and I score some frags. So there's uh, lots of opportunities and being a member of a club always helps if you're looking for stuff. I don't tend to live in the for sale forum, so I usually miss a lot of opportunities. Because I, I mean, I don't even want to follow pages promoting what they sell. It drives me crazy. Because all they do is just put picture after picture of things I want that cost much too much money. So I don't do it very often. But uh, if you're looking for places to buy corals, I'm trying to think who pops into mind. Um, Unique Corals has some beautiful stuff. That's one. Uh, Jason Fox sells corals online too, I think. If you get the opportunity to go to any kind of event near you, frag swaps, coral uh, farmer shows, that's a real thing, by the way, the coral farmer market. Uh, they happen all over the U.S. Reef of Palooza has all these corals for sale. Uh, Aquashella and Macna, those type of shows have corals for sale. Um, reef stock is happening here and I feel like it's in a couple of weeks or it's, it's in Denver. That's coming up soon. I mean, there's just so many opportunities if you just put your ear down to the ground and listen. So, you know, check, jump on your social media and start looking around, see what's near you. Uh, if there are fish stores near you, go visit them all. Do a road trip and go to five stores in one day <laughs> and you can start finding all kinds of cool stuff to put in your tank. Carl says, my tank has been set up in September and nitrates are at 3. Phosphate is never above 0 0.03 and I'm getting green hair algae and I can't figure out why. Well, your tank is young, so it's kind of going through the ugly stage and your nutrients are good, but I, you didn't mention the cleanup crew. So if you don't have a whole bunch of little mouths chewing down new algae growth coming off of your relatively new rock work, you're going to have hair algae issues. So you want to get in there with all kinds of critters hermit crabs and snails, and you want to rip out what you can manually to get it off the tank. If there's a lot in your tank, then rip out as much as you can, and then 20 minutes later, test your phosphates. And I guarantee your number will be much higher than 0 0.03 because it's all bound up in the algae. But you need a cleanup crew. And if you don't, I have an article on my website that shows a whole list of different critters you can get for your tank. So you have lots of options. Urchins are a nice choice. Uh, like I said, uh, oh, emerald crabs are another nice choice. I mean, there's so many things you can get that can help, but don't neglect hermit crabs. Because I remember I had a tank full of snails and I had this algae growing in the tank. I was like, why do I still have this? And I asked Frank, and because I just couldn't think of it. And he says, well, do you have any hermit crabs in there? I was like, no, I don't have any. He says, why not? And I was like, I don't know. So I bought some hermit crabs and I put them in the tank. And 10 minutes later, I, I looked at the patch where the algae was, and they were just like, with their little pincers, just cutting and ripping it off the rock. I was like, oh, I feel so much better now. So don't be scared of hermit crabs. People give them a bad rap, but they actually have a beneficial use in the ocean. And if you get um, blue-legged hermits, they're more aggressive than red-legged hermits. And red-legged hermits are what I would totally get. Now, I'm not talking about scarlet hermits. Scarlet hermits are like expensive. They're like six, eight dollars a piece. Hermit crabs tend to be cheaper. They might be a dollar, they might be less, they might be more, but you know, get some red-legged hermits. And 
you didn't say what size your tank was, but generally speaking, I like one critter per gallon. So that's why a lot of times I'll recommend buying them online because you'll save money in group packs. And uh, reef cleaners is one great place to get uh, a cleanup crew from. And then you've got saltwateraquarium.com is also doing cleaner packages. Live Aquaria does cleaner packages. There's quite a few on the web. <laughs> I just saw Andrea's post. My coral. Let's get that out a little bit. I want to make this a little less long. A little bit bigger. There we go. Nope, it's gone. Eric says, I like the big blue coral in the front center. Is that a chalice? No, that is a... Lithophylon. And I grew it from a nugget. Little tiny thing. It's a slow grower, but it has become a uh, focal point of the tank. It's a... Uh, it's got a thousand little mouths on it. It's crazy. And it grows the mouths in rows. If you, you know, I can't zoom in on that for you, but if you look at it, you can kind of see there's like these light blue areas and the, those light blue areas are kind of in a row. And that's how lithophylon grows their, their, themselves. And they have a lot of tentacles that wiggle too, which makes it pretty. It's not stagnant. Josh says, yeah, I thought Anthea's, uh for sure, he was talking about the fish he asked me about before. He said, I just got a male Fiji lyre tail, and man, oh man, is he beautiful, instead of just being red and gold. Yeah, the uh, the males, they have that purplish color, and they're gorgeous, and uh, they're very active. And they love seven girlfriends, so don't forget to get them a bunch of females. Jason says, what gives? No fire pit chat? You know, I would love to just do a live stream from outside by the fire pit, but you're going to hear the dogs barking. You're going to hear the sirens wailing because there's always an ambulance or a, a uh, fire truck going by all the time. <laughs> it never stops. I'm like, really, day or night? I'm like, how bad is my neighborhood? <laughs> or how much trouble are my neighbors in? What is going on? But yeah, I don't know. Maybe just wearing a, this kind of microphone, it might not pull in all that noise from out there. I have no idea. But I'd love to try to do a show from out there one day. Heck, I would just sit there by the fire and read Coral Magazine to y'all. <laughs> I just need one of those little clip lights because, you know, I'm going to probably doing the fire after dark. And that way I'd have this clip light to light up my magazine. Speaking of magazines, okay, so I told you guys the new issue of Coral Magazine came out. I'm still working on the last issue. <clears throat> I got near the back, and there's a whole article about the Blue Ridge Coral. It goes on for like four or five pages. And I've had the Blue Ridge Coral now for... 19 years in my reef. Matter of fact, it is right there. That is my Blue Ridge Coral. There's a monster piece of it going down on the rockwork beneath it too, which you see is the top part. So this coral, it basically only hails from one part of the world. There is a chance it, there's other areas, but science hasn't figured it out yet. But what was interesting is, and I got to reread the article because as I was reading, I was like, what? It just kept surprising me. I was like, I just want to read this article on camera. Um, it has to grow to a certain mass before it'll ever spawn, which I thought was really interesting. And it only spawns once a year. And it puts out these polyps, which I've never seen on mine, ever. And I've had it for 19 years. I've had a big piece of it. I've had small pieces of it. I put a new small piece on this reef, and it has grown into a huge area again. It has a weird tendency to shed. It's in the leather family. It, it can handle tons of flow. It can handle being exposed to the air. It can have waves crashing into it. But um, it, it, it's a huge survivor. And even when there's a lot of coral bleaching, the Blue Ridge coral just kind of hangs in there and ignores it, even over in Australia. I mean, it's fascinating stuff, right? But the white polyps, that's the thing. I went and visited a fish store in Louisiana. I've mentioned this on the stream a couple of times in the past. But I remember I was in the store and there was this huge coral in the back. You know, there was this tank built in the wall and there was this huge coral in the back of that huge tank. And I was like, what the heck is that thing? And they were like, what are you talking about? I said, that one in the back, that big structure. And they said, that's Blue Ridge Coral. It's like, no, it's not. I'm like, yes, it is, Mark. I'm like, 
No, it's not. It's 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 white. It's covered. I mean, Blue Ridge is a brown coral, maybe honey brown. It, it's kind of slick looking. It looks wet underwater. It's weird. And I said, those are the polyps. I'm like, what polyps? They're never polyps. So anyway, in the magazine, there's pictures of the Blue Ridge coral covered with these polyps like I saw in the fish store. And I've looked at mine a thousand times. The most I've ever seen come out of the skin of that coral are hair. So they're not the typical polyps like you see on an SPS. Even though the Blue Ridge coral is kind of parked in the SPS family, sort of, it puts out a polyp with eight tentacles that's more like a zinnia. It's a feathery polyp rather than the rounded polyps in Montipora. But yet, in the pictures with the zoom, they had these little fight, uh, fat little puffy Mickey Mouse hands, <laughs> you know, the, the gloved hands. And I'm just looking at them like, I cannot believe this. And it said in the article that these polyps will only come out like once a year when it's getting ready to spawn. I was like, well, I guess mine is never going to spawn because I've never seen this in my tank ever. And the one fish store I did see it in must have been about to have a spawning event. And that's why I happened to see it. But they acted like it always looked like it was covered in snow all the time. So I'm not really sure about that part. Really interesting coral. And by the way, the, uh, the inside of it, if you break it in half and look inside, it looks blue and it kind of has a honeycomb structure to it. You know, it kind of looks uh, hollow, like 3D printed, you know? And I have always heard the reason it turns blue is because it takes up iron from the water as it grows. Well, in the article, it said they aren't really sure why it's blue. And that, yes, it could be taking up some iron, but it didn't really, that wasn't categorically a fact. So uh, there's still some stuff we have to learn about this coral. Very interesting article. So if you are not a subscriber to Coral Magazine, you can buy the issues from me off my website. They're, I always bring them in and I put them in your box with the other things you buy. So they're eight, I think they cost $8 an issue. And uh, I always recommend put in the box with other things. If you just buy it by itself, it's $9 shipping because it's a print magazine and I can't even send a book rate because there's advertising in it because it's a magazine and not a book. So you got to pay real shipping for it. And uh, so it costs as much as the magazine, if not slightly more. But it's worth the read if you are paying uh, whatever that is, $17 an issue. There's only six issues a year. Um, and so, yes, I bring them in and I read them and I love them. They are really good articles, really good pictures. And uh, you're missing out if you're not following that one magazine specifically. Slapsfish says, I want a test of an old fish will get along with a new fish before adding. Can you put up a photo of the new fish? Or maybe a little sculpture? <laughs> you just 3D print yourself a peppermint angel fish and drop it in. Um, I think fish are smart enough to know when they're looking at something weird in the tank, like a sculpture or a plastic version of it. It's not moving, it's not breathing, it's not doing anything. Even if you had it like bobbing around on a thread, I think they'd kind of ignore it. So I don't think that'll do anything. A photograph of the fish, I don't think that'll work. I do know sometimes they will try a photograph of a fish next to the tank when there's aggression in the tank, like to make a yellow tang hate another yellow tang. So they put a picture there hoping it'll be distracting, quit attacking the, the other fish. But that's kind of hit or miss. I think, I mean, I would look up compatibility, check it in Google first, check Live Aquaria. A lot of times they have really good compatibility charts for the fish in question, and you can see if uh, these are natural enemies or if they're naturally friendly or if they're kind of iffy. It's kind of nice to just have some general knowledge, realizing that the fish do not read the same books and watch the same YouTube videos we watch, and they have their own personalities. And even though you might read everywhere, it's totally okay. It could be a nightmare, or you might read everywhere it's an awful idea, and yet it works perfectly for you. These kind of one-offs do happen. It's just kind of the nature of this hobby. Nothing is 100% in stone. There's very few things that are absolutes in this hobby. Uh, you could try putting a video of the fish in front of your tank, because now at least it's moving. Like put an iPad or something in front of the tank and just see if there's a reaction. When, what I do with all new fish that go in my tank is I put them in the Peacemaker for three days, this allows them to dissipate their stress hormone into the water column and keep them safe from being attacked. 
and it also allows them to eat some of the food I'm putting in the tank. They get to see each other without being able to hit each other. And then after the three days, I will then pour it into the tank and I almost never have aggression problems in my tank. It just seems to work out really well this way. And I've been doing it like this for like since 2010. Insane Reefer says, hey, Insane Reefer, I'm building your Peacemaker this weekend. It hasn't gone out yet. It should ship on Tuesday. Uh, he says, uh, I have to have sand. I don't care about people saying it's not beneficial. I have to have sand too. When I go diving in the ocean, when I go scuba diving, if I go snorkeling, everywhere I go, there's rock and sand. I can't find the glass bottom. I've been looking. There's just not a spot. Eric says, it's really neat to get to see what these corals look like when they're grown out. I love your tank. Part of the reason it looks like it does is because I don't frag. <laughs> I know a lot of people want to frag and they want to like recoup their money. But I don't. I mean, whether I buy frags or they're given to me, and I have bought frags, I guarantee you. Yes, some things are given to me. It happens. But uh, I buy frags and I spend 80 bucks on this. I mean, there's a little tiny twig far left, far left of it. I'm pointing the wrong way. Far, far left, right above the clear rash right there. It's this tall. And I put it in a dip, and I took it out of the dip, and I looked at it, and it looked white. And I was like, what? And I put it in the tank, and it looked white. And I was like, oh. I just killed like a $90 frag like that. But then I've been watching it, and it's got some pink and orange color coming out of it. I'm like, oh. So the dip I used was, again, too harsh for this one specific Acropora. But it's got life. And, one, and I'll be taking a, a macro picture of it and showing you guys what it looks like now. And then in six months, I'll show you this cute little colony. But uh, I don't like to trim pieces off to like recoup money. I, I just, I sell things for a living so I can have a reef tank, just like you have a job and you have a hobby that's a reef tank. And I just find that I have a saying I've been saying for a long time. I will not frag a frag, okay? <laughs> I'll post a picture of something. People are like, oh my God, I want a piece of that. I'm like, nope, I am not touching that. It is a frag. But even then, I let it grow and become a big beast because I like to just let things grow. And it's just how I do my hobby. I, I understand why people want to recoup it, but you know what? We all eat food and we poop it out and we don't recoup it. <laughs> we don't cook enough so we can sell some to the neighbors and then have our dinner plate too. We just make our food, we eat it, we poop it. So I grow coral to enjoy it. I, I try to show you a tank that has no weird plastic anywhere. I hate frag racks in the display. I, uh, I like to you know just show what I feel like it would look like in the ocean and look as natural as possible and keep my hands out of the tank as much as possible. Hi, Greenwoods. Yes, Reef Keeper, Flatworm Stop and Coral Booster. Oh, Coral Booster, thank you. Yeah, those are the two I'm using for the next three months. Oh no. <laughs> he says, I've used both for over two years and never beat the Acropora eating flatworms. That's terrible news. He says, I finally beat them by removing all the acros and dipping corals for everything. I'm not going to do that. Back in the day when I had Acropora eating flatworms the first time, um, I just did the turkey based. No, actually, I used a maxi jet and I just blew off the corals and just blew them off. You know, any ones that look suspect, I blew them off and blew them out. I just hold the power head there forever until the flatworm flew off and my antheus gobbled it up and he would wait for the next flatworm and I'd go to a new spot and a flatworm fly off and the liar tail would just gobble it up. And that was our system. It worked great. So it's what I recommend. And uh, I would, I don't want to ever have to do what you described, ever. So hopefully this stuff will work in my tank. I mean, that's the thing, like, uh, no pox did not work for me at all. And I used four or five bottles of the stuff. And yet people swear by it. <laughs> so it's always different for someone else. Uh, Justin says, if you have a deep sand bed, how would you recommend removing half of it? What's the risk of removing the top layer and keeping the sand at the very bottom? Would it cycle again? The, uh, when you're removing a sand bed, like to remove it, you're going to want to take out 25% per week. Just work your way across. Don't Try to take off the top layer, just suck out a quarter of the tank, and then the next week, grab another quarter of the tank, and then the next week, another quarter, and finally the end of it, if you're trying to remove it all. 
Um, if you're wanting to remove it for a big cleaning, which you could do and then put it back in, you could do that as well. My actual reef that you're looking at in this video has been sitting on top of an acrylic support structure for the last nine years. I uh, have these huge slabs of acrylic, and then there's these acrylic posts sticking on top of the slab, and I set them in the bottom of the tank, and I put all the rock on top of those pillars, and then I poured all the sand in afterwards. So if my sand bed wants to shift, my rock work will not. And there's an article about that on reef, uh, reefaddicts.com. Yuri says, have you heard about uh, C-Lab 28? Have you tried it, heard it? Nope, don't know what that is. Maybe I do and I don't know it, <laughs> but I don't think I know what that is. Larry says, do you have an updated picture on the orange crush coral? I think I know which one you're talking about, and it's right there. It's in the center. It's dead center under Marilyn Monroe there. And uh, I need to get a fresh macro. It doesn't seem to have grown any, but it's definitely the same, which I'm happy about. Carl, if we're talking about the same tank from before, because I can't remember if yeah, it was you talking about green hair algae showing up in your tank, you need more hermit crabs. Yes, I will definitely send you the tracking number. I'm leaving on Wednesday, so your order ships on Tuesday. So, and when I do, it, the, sh the uh, tracking number will go out to you that night. Taylor says, I have a 20 gallon. How would you transfer everything to a 90 gallon? Do I need to cycle the new tank first? I'd recommend you do. Um, it's not, you absolutely have to. Because basically, what you could do, I mean, there's two ways of looking at it. Number one, you set up the 90, and then you let it cycle. And then after three, four weeks, you then transfer everything. You just take everything out of the 20 and put in the 90 because it's nice and solid. Uh, the other choice is, like, if you were putting the 90 where the 20 is, that means you have to take everything out, get the 20 and the stand out of the way, put the new stand in place, put the new tank in place, put the sand and rock in. And then you would take all the contents you took out of the 20 and put it in your 90. That's a tank transfer. That can be done on the same day. That's just like the one time when I had to remove my 29 gallon to get it out of the living room so they could replace the carpet. So while it was down, I cleaned it really well. And then as soon as they left, I set it up again, put everything right back in. It was a tank transfer. It was almost like I gave them a new glass box, even though I just gave them a new clean glass box. But that, that's how I handled that one. And I've done this numerous times over the years where it's an instant setup. It, because if you keep everything submerged, the rock is submerged, the sand is wet at all times, you're not going to get a cycle. It's when you leave things exposed and you put it all out on a big tarp and you're trying to pick, I want this rock and that rock, and you're doing that kind of stuff, and it's all sitting there exposed to air, then you start getting die off. And you, any sponges on or in the rock that exposed to air, they die and they create ammonia, and ammonia leads to cycle. So we want to avoid that at all costs. And so if you take the rock out of the tank, what I do is I physically suck some of the water out of the tank into a bucket. Then I reach in the tank and I take the rock and I lift it out of the water and put it in the bucket of the same water that I just took out of the tank. And then I grab the next rock and I do the same thing. And if I run out of room, I get a second bucket, suck some more water out of the tank into the second bucket, grab more rock, and as you put the rock in, the, the displacement raises the water level in the bucket. So you can get in quite a few pieces of rock before you need to go to bucket number two. And then any corals, you can set them on those rocks temporarily while you're dealing with the tank situation itself. The sand, if it's like I talked about earlier, if the sand bed is less than six months old, you can just scoop it out of one tank, put it in the next. If it's older, I would either use brand new sand, which you can buy bagged sand from the fish store. You can buy bagged live sand from the fish store. Um, or you can wash your sand, which is going to take you an extra half hour or so, and put that in with your, uh, your new sand because it's a 90 gallon. And then also, save, no matter what you're doing, 
if you have to wash your sand, I would scoop one or two cups of your current sand bed and put it in a Ziploc bag and just fling it in the bucket where it stays, you know, temperature, this keeps the same temperature as your livestock that's pending. And that way, when you get the new tank running, you can lower that Ziploc bag into the tank and open it up and dump the live sand from your old tank onto the new sand to help seed it with fresh critters into your new sand. So those are some of my thoughts. I hope it helps. Kink No Picks <laughs> says, what can I do about filter sock uh, overflowing? Slowing down the rate is ineffective. The sock is from BRS. There are different microns of sock. So there's a, a very common micron sock is a 200 micron. Another common one's 100. And then there's the super fine ones that are like 10 micron, 5 micron, or less. The ones that are super fine, like 5 micron, they're going to overflow much sooner. But filter socks normally, like a 100 micron or 200 micron, should last you several days before they overflow. And you would just set it up in your sump, and after three days, you remove it and put a new clean one in, and you keep doing this for the rest of your life. And uh, if you're changing them every three days, they should not be overflowing. Um, Insane Reefer says, I have five acros. I won from Polo Reef, and one is a brown base with blue corallites. What do you think it is? Well, it's a possibility of being a tenuous, maybe, but that's with zero visibility. I have no idea what you're describing. Jamie says, how do you not scratch your Starfire glass as often as you clean it? I'm very specific. So when it comes to Starfire or Diamante or any of these other low iron glass tanks, the number one rule is never use metal on it. And so I love to use credit cards, gift cards, hotel key cards to scrape. If there's something hard and stubborn on the glass, I will chip, chip, chip at that with a credit card first. Flipper makes a really nice handle that you can put those plastic cards in and you can just go ahead and do your thing. Um, once a month, I'd say, once every six weeks, I use the Handy Blade, which is actually a type of razor blade. It's a double-edged blade. It says the word handy on it, H-A-N-D-Y. And I put it in a thing that is glued to a mag float. And I just got this in the mail this week. So this is a more durable, robust, super hard plastic that I'm gonna glue to a mag float. And it's got the handy blade in there. And you will then take your magnet and just clean with a brand new blade every time. I never leave it in the tank. I use it, I, I do the front glass for 10 minutes, I do the end glass for four minutes, I do the back glass for six minutes, and then I take it out of the tank, I open it up, I remove the blade, I rinse it under water, I coat the blade with cooking oil, I wrap it up in a paper towel and put a clothespin on it so I can find the stupid thing, and then the next time I use it, I turn the blade upside down so the word handy is upside down. That's, that's, um, that's my hint to know it's the second time I'm using it. Obviously, if it's in a paper towel and it's covered in oil, it's been used. <laughs> if it was brand new, it'd still be in the package that they sell them in. So I use it handy face up, scrape the tank. Six weeks later, I will then, it's time to do it again. I turn it upside down, do it again. And with this, I can go all the way down to the sand bed completely. I can go against every coral, even the corals growing up the glass. I get as close as I can. I get near the silicone seams. I, I do along the top rim to get, what coralline is trying to grow downward. You can see it there barely in the background behind the green slimer. You can see that's all coralline coming down and this thing will take that, chip it off. Chip, 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 chip. And of course it damages the blade. And that's why they're basically, remember it's a double-edged blade, but it's kind of like single use two times, if that makes any kind of sense. Anyway, this is something new that could be coming to market. Uh, the person sent it to me says, try it out and give him feedback. And he loves it. He's been using it for his clients. And uh, so I need to get myself a new mag float to glue this on unless I can pry my old one off. So that is in the works. But my cleaning magnet is always in the tank, always on the glass. And I use it all the time. And I do inspect it from time to time. I look at it and see if there's something growing in there like spirorbid worms, um, anything that could be getting in there. I don't want to catch an asterina between the magnet and the glass. So I, I always look. And because I jump the corner to go around the corner and do more. And that is how I keep my glass from getting scratched. Now my 
glass does have a few scratches that have happened over the years trying different products, but um, I'd love to say it's less than seven scratches total on a nine-year-old tank, which is pretty good. Angel says, what is actually live sand? Can beneficial bacteria really be able to colonize a sand bed? So I don't know the exact answer to this question. I mean, I, I have a general feeling or general, you know, I've asked questions. Like, for example, I went and talked with Judd at Caribsey, and I said, how do I dispute or, no, refute the comments I read when people say, that's not live sand. It's been in a sealed bag, in a truck, in a warehouse. That It's just a ripoff. It's a scam. It's snake oil. I'm like, no, it's not. I know for a fact it's not. But how do I refute it? And he said, have you ever made brine shrimp? I was like, yeah. He says, you grew it from eggs, right? And I was like, yeah. And how did they start? Were they living? I was like, no, they're eggs. He says, were the eggs moving? I'm like, no, they're in a dry, sealed coffee can. He says, right. So you take those dormant eggs, you put them in salt water with, with aeration, and they turn into sea monkeys. I'm like, yes. He says, that's the same with live sand. So there is bacteria in there that's dormant in the bag. There's moisture in the bag. And then when you open it, oxygen gets in and it brings them out of, or it reanimates them. And I'll tell you this, every time I put live sand in a brand new tank, within two or three days, I have these beautiful like snowflakes all over the glass. They look like little tiny, I, I just said it, snowflakes. They're actually a type of non-motile jellyfish, sort of like in the hydroid family. They don't swim like jellyfish, they go to the glass. And you take your cleaning magnet, you go whoosh. And then within seconds, they, whoosh, they come back like magnets and they're all over the glass again. And then within three or four days, they're gone. Well, where did those come from if not from the live sand? And it always happens with a new bag of live sand in a brand new pristine tank that's just operational without critters in there yet. So it comes from that. And that stuff is really good for your tank. And so I do recommend live sand, even though it costs more than dry sand. <laughs> Desert Fish Keeper, you're not wrong. He says, I think some people frag a lot because they start with a million frags all next to each other and they need the space. Now that's true. And that's why they put 10 frag racks in the tank too, to put them all over the place. But, and I do see that. I see a tank with like a lot of rock work or a lot of branching twig like things. And then they plant them all, you know, every inch, every inch and a half all the way across. I'm like, there's no way you're going to have a hundred corals growing in there one day. You're going to have five or six dominant species, and most of this is not going to be here. And that is the sad truth. So, you know, I, I try to have things with three or four inches between them. You saw that picture I showed you before. Look how far apart these corals were that I planted last year. Let me find the picture again. This one. Nope. Hang on. This one. Let me find that top picture. And you can see... I don't know if you guys can see my mouse pointer or not. There, you probably can't, but there is the Blue Ridge Coral above the anemone. To the left, there's a frag. Then there's another frag next to that, and there's one in front of it, and then there's the green slimer. It's two little branches. That's all that survived. And then you go over, I don't know, three inches, and there's another acro, which, which was really cool, but did not do well in my tank and then died. And then three inches, four inches away, there's another acro behind Spock's tail. And, you know, there's some space and there's a couple more little branches and then there's some space. I mean, there was space between my corals. And then a year later, those same, you know, all the ones that lived <laughs> got big. So, including the green slimer, which you guys see right now, just above my head to my right. Thank you, Sonny Gould, for wishing us a wonderful weekend, a three-day weekend. There's no work on Monday, y'all. Okay. Insane Reefer says, uh, not to rush you, Elliot from Marine Collector says, you probably won't ship my tank in a week from purchase. Well, okay, so the thing is, I'm leaving on Wednesday, and I'm coming back the following Monday, so I wanted to get your order out. And your peacemaker's cut out. I just got to start gluing. And I figure if I glue it today get the top on it tomorrow, then it can cure Monday. It's, it would cure Sunday and Monday and uh, ship on Tuesday. It should be fine. That's the goal. 
I like to let things sit for two days after I'm done gluing. So I, I finish gluing that day so it has time all through the night and all through the day and all through the night and then the next day and then it goes in a box. Um, Chris says, calcium at 600 because of bad salt, would, what would you do, a 40 gallon tank? Well, you can buy a different brand of salt mix and mix that up and then test that for calcium. And if the number's right, then start doing water changes with the corrected salt water because that will bring that number down. Uh, calcium takes forever to come down naturally. So I wouldn't just say wait it out because you could be waiting it out for a year. <laughs> it can take forever. It's such, it goes down so slowly that water changes are really the way to do it, but you have to change it with salt water that has a lower calcium level than what you currently have in your aquarium. Acupuncture says, didn't Dwayne give you a coral called ectoplasm? How is it? Actually, that's that huge thing over there. Um, I wish I could point to it. <laughs> I wish my mouse pointer would, like if I do this, it would just show up on your screen. I do not think that happens. If I'm wrong and it does, that'd be fantastic. But um, that right there above the coral beauty, that is the ectoplasm. It came from Ryan, though, I believe. Ryan from the Thousand Gallon Reef, not from Dwayne. And there's another piece of it in the back of my reef that's half doing well and half bad. It's sitting directly in front of Vortec. It, it held up for, man, six months. And then it started dying and growing algae because it's just getting hammered with flow. But there's still parts around it that are really good. And I really want to trim out the bad parts, but I don't want it to just crumble or break off. I, I, I like what's there. So ah. Anyway, I have two, two sections of that coral, but that one in the front is doing really, really well. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm not familiar with C-Lab 28 at all. Sorry, guys. It sounds sort of, yeah, he says it releases minerals and elements in the water as it dissolves. It's great for a nanosystem. Yeah, I may have seen a picture of this thing. It kind of looks like a salt lick for rabbits or something. Um, yeah, no, I, I have no experience with that whatsoever. Okay. Well, thanks for telling me, Darren. He says, I believe the flatworm stop and the coral booster does help. I didn't lose any coral while using it, but I still saw the acrobat for eating flatworms. Um, just as you described, it makes the flesh less palpable to the acrobat for eating flatworm. So, I mean, here's the thing. Let's say I make my guys super tough, and then I do my turkey baster or my ceche slash maxujet blowing method, and then I have my bimaculatas devouring them. That could be my solution. Josh says, would it be a bad idea to use ChemiClean to deal with a persistent cyano problem on the sand bed? It makes no sense, but it gets better when I dose PO4 or you know, phosphate directly. No, use ChemiClean, do it. Use it to get rid of it. ChemiClean or Red Cyano RX, both products I think are the same. They both do the job. Whenever I see cyano in a tank, I just get rid of it. I don't care if it's on the glass, on the sand, on the rock, on all of it. I siphon out as much as I can first. If there's a lot, if it's just your sand bed and the rest of the tank looks nice, then I would just treat the tank. I mean, again, if you want to siphon some out, you can. But then treat the tank, and that way in three to five days, this thing is behind you, and you don't have to look at it ever again. Uh, it is a seasonal thing. It could return. If you have to treat again once again, you just do it. I treated for cyano a year and a half ago, <clears throat> and I haven't treated for it since, and I haven't had cyano issues in my tank at all. So, And even when I did it, I did it because it was a little bit, because I didn't want it to get into a big problem. Checking that mic. Chris says that it seems like the mic is getting a little low. Fresh batteries and everything. I don't know. The volume looks correct on the screen, too. Thank you for telling me. Jerry says, have you ever had to search your sand bed for a cucumber when it dies? No, I've not had any cucumbers die. What I've had happen over the years, because I bought one cucumber probably in 2003. And it split and made two of itself. And then it split and made three of itself. And then it got moved into the 280 gallon in 2004. And at one point, I think I saw nine of them in the tank. 
and I saw them sometimes go up the glass. I saw them literally crawl around the Vortec pump and hug it. <laughs> I, you know, I've had them forever. And occasionally when I'm redoing something or I'm breaking down a tank and setting up a new tank and I'm taking the plumbing apart, I'll find one inside the PVC pipe living in there. Granted, not very big because how much food can you get in a pipe where the water is doing this all the time? But uh, I have found some and I've occasionally had one die on a Vortec, but I've never had to dig through the sand to find them. They're not hiding like that. Uh, maybe it's because I use tiger tails. But uh, I love those things and I, I don't really have any issues with them. Uh, currently, my reef, they're kind of food dependent, you know, like the, the amount of food they can find regulates how many exist in your tank. And I must not be a monster heavy feeder because I don't have lots of them like the old days. I probably have three or four in my reef right now. Uh, Lincoln says, any suggestions for keeping the intake of a protein skimmer clean from the Ketomorpha? Is it hard to add a baffle to a sump? Well, I hope it's not hard to add a baffle. And yes, some you should have s sections in your sump. You should have a section specifically where the water pours in where the protein skimmer sits as well because that will always be the same height. And then it could be your return zone or it could be a refugium and then a return zone. But a strainer can be put on the front of the skimmer. It might have to be a DIY project or a 3D printed thing that you've created specifically for you. I would try to make something that's big with a small orifice on the back. So you have like a big surface area and then put that like a doorknob, right? Just Take this doorknob, you know how the doorknob's big enough for your hand, but there's a little stem on the back. Press that doorknob shaped 3D printed object onto the front of your protein skimmer. So it's a big surface area so it can't get clogged up and it can keep drawing in water without slowing the skimmer down at all. And then occasionally take it off to clean it. And or if you have two, put one on the skimmer and then when it starts to look dirty, put the clean one on the skimmer, take the old one off and soak it, scrub it clean and set it aside. And then you can just swap them occasionally. Um, that would be one method, but having baffles between compartments, absolutely, to keep that key to morpher where it belongs and keep your skimmer safe from snails or anything else from getting in the front of it. Reefkeeper says, I just set up another tank using Aquaforest bio sand. It's a different approach. The sand is dry and they include two bottles of bacteria to seed the sand for 24 hours before adding it to the tank. Neat. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Aquaforest does things differently. That's for sure. Okay, so there is no pointer. I didn't think there was. I wonder if there ever will be or if it's just because I'm running this as a green screen on a video. I'll have to find out. Problem Prone says, I have an algae problem that appears to be hair algae, but it's not. It might be bryopsis. Without typing it all out, I've tried nearly everything to beat it. Only fluconazole barely helps. Please help before I tear it all down. If it's bryopsis, it's a very, very coarse algae. It, it, doesn't, it looks feathery when you look at it closely versus hair algae looks like hairs, like hairs on your head. Um, and the trick to beating bryopsis Number one, get yourself a power head you can hold in your hand or turkey baster if you like doing this a lot <laughs> and blast the bryopsis. Just blow it off weekly minimum, just at least once a week because bryopsis traps detritus in its core to create its own little nutrient full of deep sand bed. It literally makes itself a bed of food to snack on to be healthy and strong and, and sturdy. But if you keep blowing it out, it doesn't have that to feed on and it weakens it. And lettuce nudibranchs are known to eat it, which is a, a little fluffy looking critter that feels like a feather in the water. I mean, you can barely hold the darn thing. It wants to float away and you put it on the bryopsis and it'll eat it. And the next day you go find your nudibranch again and you put it back on the bryopsis because it's stuck to a power head. I mean, <laughs> they are super light. It, it's ridiculous. And I remember I'd find another one in the refugium and I'd go take another refugium and put it back on the bryopsis and it will eat it. So, I mean, that's one method. Another one is to take the rock that's got the bryopsis growing and actually 
take it out of the tank, put it over some kind of a workspace, and maybe use a syringe and peroxide and dribble it all over where the paralysis is. Or another method is to actually put the peroxide in a water pick and water pick the bryopsis. <laughs> but then you need to take the rock and put it inside another bucket of salt water, rinse away that peroxide after about three minutes, and then put the rock back in your tank again. And this is kind of messing up your aquascape, it's messing with your corals, and if there are corals on there, you don't want to get the peroxide on the corals, so you have to really target, so it's harder. But that would be some of my specific things that I would suggest. Young says, why did you stop the roller mats on your system? Well, I don't run filter socks in the first place. I don't really have a need for roller mat either. I did it for a while, it was okay. It was kind of in my way. I think I was always worried about knocking it over. I was always worried about changing the roller on there. And I was just like, I just, I don't need this thing. It wasn't even handling all of my drain water. It was draining one portion of my drain went to it. One portion went to the skimmer, one portion went to the refugium, one portion was an emergency drain. It just, it was sort of like, eh. It, it just seemed like it'd be one more thing on my system that I had to babysit, so I took it off. Uh, Chris asked about the beautiful piece in the middle that, in its particulars. I think it's the lithophylon I was talking about, unless you're talking about the one up high, which would be the blue tort, uh, which is an acropora. But I think you're talking. And then there's one that's level with my shoulder, a big acro. I have no idea what it is. I can't seem to get answers. I've asked quite a few people, and people are guessing. Nobody seems to know what it is. Nobody seems to believe me when I say, like the person I got it from says I didn't get it from him. I don't know what it is, but it's pretty and it's big. Uh, Hillbelly Reefer says, what do you set your MP60s at? The constant reef crest, et cetera. Um, it's actually four different phases each day. It has um, nutrient export mode. It has reef crest. It has lagoon mode. It has... Uh, constant mode it, it goes through the different ones and it's at different rates and it i just programmed it once <laughs> what four years ago and never touched it again i it's just i don't even look at it i'd have to literally log in and say oh yeah to remind myself what time different phases are happening i love that it it's that there are options but i don't do anything else beyond that i just set it up and i plug it in and i'm done Burke says, will ChemiClean work for regular red algae? Well, if we're talking about cyanobacteria, yes. Uh, cyanobacteria is considered the blue-green algae of the world, but typically it looks red in our aquariums under blue light. But you may be talking about a different type of algae, like cotton candy algae or red turf algae. Um, these are there's, there's different things, so I can't really answer your question because I don't know what it is. I can tell you that ChemiClean works great for cyanobacteria. Well, that was our last question. I think we've been talking long enough. We've been on here for more than two hours. So let me just uh, remind you, it is time to test your water. But I already said my spiel earlier, so I'm not going to repeat the whole thing. I just wanted to remind you so you wouldn't forget as you're hanging up. And I thank you again so much for tuning in, asking all your questions, participating, being a part of this channel. And tell your friends, because there's always room for more people on the live stream. Bye, guys. Have a great weekend and enjoy your Monday off.